and why the first game comes from Winnipeg, where 18-year CFL veteran Bob Cameron kicks off the season against Jacques Climy and the Montreal Alouettes, this year's beasts from the East. In game two, you'll see more fireworks on the field than in the sky when East meets West. Hamilton's own Mike Morial leads the new-look Ticats into battle at McMahon Stadium to face Vince Danielson and the Calgary Stampeders, who are the favorites out West this season. So sit back and enjoy Canada's Day as TSN rings in the CFL season with Canada's Game. shot of the peg winnipeg manitoba where the bombers and montreal alouettes are getting ready to open the 1998 cfl season happy canada day everybody and thanks for making football part of your party my name is james duffy and welcome to a brand new season of cfl football on tsn we're getting things started in fine fashion we have a double header for you owls and bombers kick it off and then later tonight we have the tie cats in calgary to visit the Stamps, and this is only the beginning. We have 34 games on our schedule this season. 16 of them will be Friday night football, and a new season means a new cast of characters. We are an all-rookie crew here at CFL Control. Myself, Chris Schultz, a former offensive lineman with the Toronto Argonauts, and before that, the Dallas Cowboys, and Eric Tillman, the former general manager of the BC Lions and the Toronto Argonauts. And one of the things we're most excited about is all those problems off the field for the league have diminished. We can finally talk some football, Chris. And James, isn't that refreshing? I mean, when you look at the Canadian Football League, the number one word that is synonymous with it is perception. And right now, the perception of the Canadian Football League is all positive. All the bills are paid. All the transitional movements have been made. And I'll give you four reasons why. Number one, the association between the National Football League and the Canadian Football League has been a 100% success. Number two, TSN has put their money where their mouth is, and they've written the check, and they believe and have faith in the Canadian Football League in the long run. Number three is the association with Adidas Foot Company. One more, once more, another point of identification that each player will wear on their feet, which I think is critical because you know how competitive the shoe market business is. And number four is I really like the possibility of, by the year 2000, the Canadian College Football League Championship and the Grey Cup on the same weekend in some city. What a great possibility for an enhancement and identity, Eric. And when you have those two issues, then you have more people watching it on television and, most importantly, more people getting off their butt and going to the stadium. <laughs> Well, Chris, you're right. This is a good time for the Canadian Football League. A lot of positive news in the offseason. For the first time now the, the, that Doug Flutie is out of the league for eight years, the focus is back where it should be on the field. And I think we have unprecedented parity in the Canadian Football League. Outstanding races in both the East and the West. And again, James, with this kind of parity, I think the big winners will be the fans. All right, guys, look forward to hanging out with you all season long. And you'll find these people both very knowledgeable and very passionate about CFL football. Now, we're rookies in here. We also have a rookie getting ready to call his first CFL game. Rod Smith is with Leif Patterson in Winnipeg. Thank you, James, like you. Maybe I have the rookie jitters a little bit, but I am very excited about this beautiful atmosphere for football leap. Hot, sunny day and beach party going on in the end zone in behind us. And I know the Alouettes and the Bombers must be pretty excited. Great cups here in Winnipeg this year. Alouettes have an awfully good team this year. Yes, they really do. And boy, Rod, you talk about excitement. I'm excited about our new crew in the studio. And as the senior member on our crew this afternoon, I'd really like to welcome Chris Schultz. Had a terrific career. This guy knows football, and you, the viewer at home, you're going to enjoy his comments throughout the season. 
Eric Tillman, I've had a tremendous respect for his abilities as an executive in the CFL throughout his, his years. And between those two, they have a wealth of knowledge that you, the viewer, are going to enjoy. James Duffy, a young man, grow, grew up in Ottawa, has been around the CFL a long time. He's going to have a tough job holding these guys together. But the good news is, with James in there, it gets you out here. So, Rocket, we're happy to have you as our play-by-play -play guy this year. Thanks, I'm pleased. They wanted me to get out in the sun a little bit more. <laughs> so, James... I see who your panel is. I got a word of advice for you before we press on. That is, you can argue with Tillman, but if you want to argue with Schultz, you're on your own, bud. That's all I can say about that. Now, as far as the Alouettes leave, this is a team expected to win this year very well. I mean, they were looking up at the Argos last year, but the Argos have changed. Could be Montreal's year. Well, I really think it could be Montreal's year on paper. They certainly are the team to beat in the East. I mean, you look back over the last couple of seasons, were they the second best team in the CFL? probably by indication of those records and you know that brings on pressure but hey I'd love to have that kind of pressure and I think there's every reason they could be back here in November pressure on the Bombers as well with it being a Grey Cup year I don't know if Jeff Reinbold feels it, but maybe he should based on the kind of season he had last year. You bet he should feel some pressure. You know, as a rookie coach, you always have a grace period. Well, the grace period's over for Jeff. Uh, he's got a lot of new people, but they have been his choices, so he's going to have to answer if they don't play well. He's got a young quarterback, T.J. Rubley, and 14 other first-year starters for the Bombers. There's a lot to be done on this team, and I don't envy them opening the season against Montreal this afternoon. And as James Duffy said, it is one of two games we have today. We also have another one in Calgary with more on that. Let's head out now and join John Wells. And thank you very much, Rod. Happy Canada Day from McMahon Stadium in Calgary. We're under mostly blue skies here. And our game doesn't get underway until this evening at 8 o'clock local time. But we're looking forward to the kickoff of the season between the Calgary Stampeders and the Hamilton Tiger Cats. We'll talk Calgary first. It is a team that is trying to rebound from a disappointing playoff loss last year to Saskatchewan. Yeah, John, I think they're disappointed. And they've really picked up from where they left off last year. This is a team, while other teams in the league were really introducing themselves in training camp in day one, this team had the full playbook in and was looking forward to the start of the regular season. They're led by a quarterback right now in Jeff Garcia that is poised to take his game to a new level. He has taken a new leadership role on this team, something Wally Buono is, feels very good about. Jeff Garcia is a three-time West Division All-Star and he has looked absolutely terrific to Wally Buono so far this year. All right, guys. I feel very confident. I feel that this team is coming together the way it needs to be coming together. Uh, I know it's early in the season. But as far as an offensive group, we've been intact for a couple years now. And I think that everybody knows what they're doing. It's very explosive. Uh, there's a lot of talent on the offense. And so it makes me feel very confident about our offensive side and, and what we can do. Tiger Cats have very uh, several changes that they're looking at. They have 13 new players in their lineup, while the Stampeders have very few changes. And when you look at uh, the situation for Ron Lancaster, he really has to wonder if he's made too many changes. Well, I don't think he has, John. I think the changes that he has made have been j changes with veteran football players when you talk about Danny McManus's and the Darren Fluties. This team is going to have a great defensive side of the ball. They're going to be good on offense, better on offense than they were last year. The question is, how long will it take for them to gel? The first step in building a good football team is getting good players. I think Ron Lancaster has done that in Hamilton this year. But the second step, and probably the most important, is to have those players play together. And it remains to be seen how long it will take Edmund, uh, Hamilton to do that. Yeah, well, it's a little it's confusing. Almost like Edmonton. <laughs> because the Eskimos are almost in Hamilton this year. Calgary Stampeders are tough to beat at McMahon Stadium always. The Tiger Cats have found that out since 1988. They have lost nine straight times in this ballpark. James? All right, guys, thanks very much, and we look forward to hearing from you all season long. Now, as always, lots of changes on the field in the CFL. When we return, we're going to check out who's where and who is going to do what in the CFL. And we'll start with the Eastern Conference where there's no more Magic Flutie and T.O. And the East is now wide open. Can Matthews Argos repeat? We'll talk about it coming up next on the CFL on TSN. I am the wind. Stompin' Tom Connors music is a national treasure. Celebrate the people and places of Canada with 25 of the best Stompin' Tom souvenirs. My back still aches when I hear that word. It's Bud the Spud. 25 of the best Stompin' Tom souvenirs. 25 great reasons to celebrate Canada. It's Canada Day. In stores now.
Outdoor power tools with steels, quality, reliability, and durability, there's only one place to go. And right now, you can get steel German-engineered tremors on sale for just $149.95. Steel, built to last, priced to sell. The Argos and Owls dominated the East last season. A big gap between the top two and bottom two teams, Winnipeg and Hamilton, will be looking to close that gap this season. Now, let's see. Doug is in Buffalo. Ronnie and Danny are in Hamilton. And the Alouettes are out of the big O. Everything's changed. Let's have a look at what's going to be different in the Eastern Division this season. Lots of changes for the two-time defending champions as MVP Doug Flutie tries his luck with the Buffalo Bills. Free agent Robert Drummond bolts to the West Coast. And center Mike Kisilak, defensive back Adrian Smith, Linebacker Reggie Givens and kicker Mike Vanderjat all found work south of the border. Kerwin Bell was supposed to be the Argos' new pivot, but a broken forearm leaves the job to rookies Jay Barker and Nelon Green. While coach Don Matthews hopes that newcomers Bobby Jurison from Saskatchewan and Don Hitson can fill the void left by the 14 free agents. In Montreal, a change of venue hopes to rekindle championship hopes and to put the fans back in the stands. Management signed two explosive and exciting free agent receivers in former Ticat Mac Cody and eight-year CFL veteran speedster Eddie Brown. Former Hamilton Tiger Cat Anthony Cavillo was signed to back up quarterback Tracy Ham, and former NFL All-Star Tim Harris was a late training camp cut. Other moves include the loss of lineman Bruce Beaton to Edmonton and Mark Dixon to the Miami Dolphins. However, the Owls did sign Pierre Vercheval from Toronto. In Winnipeg, the Blue Bombers were one of the most active teams over the summer, signing non-import running back Sean Millington. Receivers Larry Thompson and Chris Armstrong were also brought in to give former World League quarterback T.J. Rubley some powerful weapons to work with. On the defensive side, former Lions Maurice Kelly and David Maeva will help to ease the loss of 1997 team defensive MVP Shante Peoples. Peoples will be missed along with team MVP and league receiving leader Milt Stiegel, both of whom pursued offers from the NFL. In Steeltown, Hall of Famer Ron Lancaster was hired to turn the Ticats around, and he brought terrific tandem Danny McManus and Darren Flutie with him from Edmonton. Also acquired to bolster an offense that was the league's worst in 1997 was 1,000-yard rusher Ronald Williams. Leaving Hamilton or slot back Burt Thornton, a preseason cut, and they thought they'd lost five-year veteran defensive tackle Mike Philbrick. He announced his retirement in March, but now he's unretired and will play another season. And Philbrick should help, but the Ticats 2-16 and 16 last year, the worst record in the league. Chris, how fast can Ron Lancaster turn this program around? Well, James, I don't think it's going to be quick. I think you've got to consider this is going to be progressive and systematic. Obviously, the fact of Danny McManus and Darren Flutie, statistically, those two guys have to have outstanding years. And Mike Morielli has to come through as a big-time player to take the emphasis off Darren Flutie and allow double coverage or man coverage for Flutie sometimes. But more than anything else, Ron Lancaster. What Ron Lancaster does exceptionally well is he changes players' habits on the practice field. You change those habits on the practice field, you're going to change his habits on the game field, and then you're going to change the entire offensive habits, defensive habits, and Eric, they're going to win some games because of Ron Lancaster. Now we go up the road. The closest <laughs> team geographically, the Toronto Argonauts, a little bit of an unknown right now, but I still have positive feelings about them. Well, Chris, questions do abound in Argo Land. If you look at the team, 15 players are gone from that Great Cup Championship squad, including Doug Flutie. Uh, many people are predicting the demise of the Argo powerhouse. I, don't, I am not one of those. I don't concur with that opinion. I do think the Argos will struggle early on offense. I think that's to be expected with two young quarterbacks. When you look at Don Matthews and his career, the guy has always had great defenses and outstanding special teams. I look for those two areas to carry the Argos earlier as the offense develops. They may not win the East, but I think, James, they are a team that's very capable of winning it in November, and they will get what better 
week by week. Now, you mentioned the two young quarterbacks, Neilon Green and Jay Barker. Winnipeg has a similar problem with a young quarterback, T.J. Rubley, will be making the start for the Bombers his first season in the CFL. Now, this guy is not your typical rookie. He is 29 years old. He's played with the Packers, the Rams, the Broncos. Not a lot of action, but he has played in the NFL. And he was with the Ryan Fire in the World League, was the MVP of the World League. Now, Chris, what do the Bombers have to do to help out T.J. Rubley? Well, I think, it, once again, it's the type of thing where you have to rely on your teammates. I mean, T.J. Rubley is not going into these games alone. He's got a great running back in Sean Millington. He's got a pretty good offensive line that was not hit that hard by free agency. And I think the big thing about Rubley is going to be the first few games in the Canadian Football League, those first six games and the first quarter in each game, just for his own personal confidence. But sometimes when you have a new quarterback, it's a rallying point for other people in the team. And you know Jeff Reinbold, he's the type of guy who bases a lot of his success on getting his teams emotionally prepared for games. That's going to help Rubley because Reinbold will not panic with Rubley in there. Now you looked at Winnipeg, they, they have a lot of transition that leads you down the road. Uh, basically Montreal, I mean you and I are in total agreement that this is the most talented team in the Canadian Football League. Chris, the Montreal Wets are loaded. There's no question about that. Larry Smith, Jim Pop, Dave Ritchie and company had a great offseason. You look on the off offensive side of the ball, Tracy Ham, uh, Mike Pringle, Chris Wright, Eddie Brown, Mac Cody. The question may be, do they have enough footballs? This is a team that will score often and from any place on the football field. Dave Ritchie's always been a very good defensive coach. I think the key for Montreal is to stay healthy. Some of their older Canadians, Doug Peterson, Pierre Virchival, Tommy Europe, some of those guys have had a history of injuries. If they stay healthy, this could be a fun year for the Owls. All right, you gave us a hint about your predictions, but we'll get their full predictions on the East and the West coming up a little bit later. When we come back, though, we're going to go West, young man, and look at the Western Division. The early favorites, the Stamps, they'll open up against Hamilton in the second half of our doubleheader tonight on TSN. We'll be right back. Hi, me again with my bits and bites. Sticking my hand in the bag and coming up with a different handful. Well, what we got here? Three cheese bits, four spiced rings, and two pretzel sticks. Delicious. Next handful, whole new ball game. You can't get bored eating bits and bites snacks because your mouth never knows till it's all over. Bits and bites by Christy. Every handful is different. Yeah. <laughs> Some were meant to glide. Some to just sit back and relax. And some were just meant to escape. On the water, you set the pace of the excitement. Discover how affordable boating really is. For a free video, call us at 1-800-808-BOAT. Or visit our website, bring the family, and come on aboard. All right, welcome back. The West standings from last year, the Edmonton Eskimos in first place at 12 and 6, Calgary at 10 and 8. It was pretty close all the way down. Saskatchewan and British Columbia tied at 8 and 10 for third. And you know what? It's the kind of bravado you expect from every coach before the season starts. Every single coach in the West thinks his team is going to be much better than last year. As we're going to find out, some of them are telling the truth and some of them are lying to themselves. You be the judge. Following the loss of their big three to Hamilton, along with receiver Eddie Brown, the Eskimos find themselves with a new look in 98. The new man in charge is head coach Kay Stevenson, reunited with David Archer, his former pivot in both Sacramento and San Antonio, as well as running back Troy Mills, a 1,000-yard rusher with the Gold Miners. Mills will be the primary back, with Tony Burse out with a broken left arm. Another of Archer's old targets in Sacramento slot back, Rod Harris, was acquired from Saskatchewan in the offseason, but was among the Eskimos' training camp cuts. In Calgary, Wally Buono's Stampeders stayed pat with no significant moves. However, they did lose offensive coordinator Danny Barrett to BC, as he returns to the Lions to play the dual role as offensive coordinator and emergency backup to Damon Allen. The Stamps did say goodbye to linebacker Marvin Pope. He was released and veteran cornerback Kenton Leonard, who retired after seven CFL seasons. It's the end of an era in Rough Rider country, as 12-year veteran defensive end Bobby Jurison was released from the team during training camp. Always a fan favorite, Jurison holds the record as the franchise's all-time sacks leader. 
Also gone are nose tackle Troy Alexander to BC and mobile quarterback Kevin Mason, ending the Ruffies QB controversy. Filling the hole on defense will be free agent linebacker Ken Benson, but there's no doubt as to who will be missed in Regina. Many changes on the West Coast as the Lions say goodbye to running back Sean Millington and Corey Philpott. And they say hello to former Argonaut sensation Robert Drummond, a powerful rusher with game-breaking abilities. He was signed as a free agent. On defense, Bruce Dixon replaces David Maeva, while three-time All-Star defensive back Glenn Rogers Jr. makes the move from Edmonton to fill the void left by Maurice Kelly. All right, lots of changes around the league, but Chris, I guess the key in Calgary is not much change. Well, you know, the one expression that I like in football, and I think it's extremely truthful, is continuity will create success, especially in the Canadian Football League. The longer you can keep your rosters together, the better people understand where everybody is, especially at critical times throughout a football game. I think when you talk about fundamentals, this is by far the most fundamentally sound team in the entire league. Wally Buono has his guys ready to go. As uh, Glenn Suter was saying, their playbook was in halfway through training camp. I think they should do extremely well and probably win the West. Now, Eric, on the other side, we have a team like Edmonton. Edmonton, to me, is the absolute enigma. I don't know if Kay Stevenson is necessarily going to adopt the Canadian Football League style. He says he will, but will he? You asked the question that many Canadians have asked, Chris, and the good news for the Edmonton Eskimos is that people have responded, the players have responded very well to Kay Stevenson at this point. He's shown himself to be a good communicator, a great teacher. In addition to that, the players really like his decision to bring Rich Stubler back as defensive coordinator. I think the key to the Edmonton Eskimos this year is addressing their Achilles Hill from the 1997 season. Will they be able to rush the football? I think they will. I look for an improved offensive line and with Troy Mills and Williams in the backfield. Field, I think Edmonton will run the football very effectively, James. All right, rushing also a question mark in Saskatchewan. The Riders were Grey Cup finalists last year. A lot of people thought that was a fluke, Chris. Well, I don't think it was a fluke. I think if you say it's a fluke, it's almost insulting to the players and the management of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. But I think the Rough Riders won a lot of games on emotion. When you look at this team, they were only 8 and 10. This is the team that peaked at the right time in October and November and had a great playoff run. And yes, that's one of the key components in the Canadian Football League. But, you know, in a sense, perhaps their luck is running out. They really didn't advance their Canadian talent. That's going to be a key issue, especially when injuries come out. So you looked at the Rough Riders. I'm not sold that they're going to have the most successful year. Now, the other team, Eric, a complete opposite situation. <laughs> Obviously, the talent and number one thing in football, you can't buy it, you, you got to recruit it, is speed. You know, Chris, how do you predict the BC Lions? Yeah. This, is, this is a team with two personalities. There's no questioning the talent on the West Coast. But last year, if you look back at this team, early in the season, they were 6-3, and three, playing very well. The second half of the season, they stumbled 2-7. and seven. They were absolutely awful at the end of the year. This is a club that was aggressive in the offseason. Adam Rita and Brenda Tamman went out, brought a lot of good football players in. They're still a mystery club. The talent is there, is the chemistry. James, of all the teams in the league, this is the one club that, that's the hardest to figure. They're very capable of finishing anywhere from first to last. All right, guys. Now, perhaps the only man who has seen all these teams firsthand is our own Glenn, the suitcase suitor. He visited every training camp this month. And, Glenn, a lot of optimism in here about what's going to happen. How do you feel about the league and the shape it's in? Well, I think the league is strengthened. You guys talked about it earlier, and I think it has done that. We're talking about football now, which is great. It's positive, and what we should be talking about. I agree with the panel on the West Division. I think it's going to be a bit of a race. Saskatchewan will likely struggle. They've made some decisions that you have to question. I'm talking, of course, about Bobby Gerson. I think the key for the BC Lions, special teams. If Jimmy the Jet Cunningham and Al Shipman can stay healthy, they're going to have the best one-two combination on returns in the Canadian Football League. So it's going to be a tight race in the West. I think that the the uh, Calgary Stampeders, of course, are the front runners. Glenn, Chris Schultz here. I think the number one thing I want to talk to you about is the fact the Calgary Stampeders defensive line. This is a football team that is a one-on-one -on -one opportunistic team. Do they have the personnel up front to create a pass rush? I think they do, Chris, and I think the reason for that is that Wally Buono has built this defense and, and the defensive line from within. Everyone that's on that line has been in the Calgary Stampeders organization for at least a couple years, and I think you're going to see big improvements from the inside. Bronzel Miller and Jeff Traversy have had great training camps and should get a good push up the middle and you know that that makes one-on-ones on the outside makes it a little easier for those guys to get to the quarterback glenn eric tillman you talk about the fact that calgary should be improved in their defensive front i think for hamilton to have a chance today they have to run the football effectively and talking to ron lancaster do you get a sense that he has confidence in his running game with with uh, ronald williams and archie amerson 
You do, Eric. You do get a sense that he likes his running backs. He thinks that both Ron Williams and uh, Archie Emerson have the ability to take the football and do something with it. Where the question mark comes in is who is going to block for them, and will that offensive line provide the holes, open up the holes for these running backs? They're going to try and do it with two different types of systems. One, they'll send Ron Williams as a lead blocker, something that he's not really used to, and have Archie Emerson carry the ball. The other way is that they'll, they'll split out Archie Emerson and give the ball to Ron Williams and see if they can get some offensive production that way either way the question mark is up front can that offensive line open the holes they're very confident in the abilities of their running backs all right Glenn thanks very much and look forward to listening to you later on with the game today all right now we have more inside stuff coming up for, for you Marty York he knows all the stuff that's going on inside the league we'll hear from him when we return the CFL on TSN and we got lots more for you Montreal and Winnipeg coming up Hamilton and Calgary tonight at 10 o'clock Stay up and finish off your Canada Day that way. Edmonton at BC tomorrow night at 10.30. And Toronto at Saskatchewan, a Grey Cup rematch Friday night starting at 8.30. Centuries ago, the humble potato was praised for its nutrition and worshipped for its delicious taste. Discover the new golden standard that's making modern history. Introducing McCain Home Fries. All the deep fried flavor of your favorite fry. Crispy outside, moist potato flavor inside. Crispy McCain Home Fries. They could change history. Taste it and believe it. All right, welcome back. When things are happening behind the scenes in the CFL, he's usually the first guy to know about it. Here's our CFL insider with Marty York. At large with Marty York. Hi, nice to be back for another season of CFL football on TSN. I have a new role this year. Each Friday night and occasionally during the midweek telecast, I'll be on hand to pass along information that I've picked up from my CFL contacts on business matters, trade rumors, and just general gossip from around the league. So let's kick off by telling you about the latest Grey Cup odds, courtesy of my friends, the odds makers in Las Vegas. The Owls are 5-2 to two favorites this year to win the whole enchilada. They're followed by Wally Buono and the Calgary Stampeders at 3-1. to one. Then come the defending champion Toronto Argonauts, and it's interesting because they're only 9-2 to two long shots. No longer do the Argos have Doug Flutie and 15 other regulars, so they're no shoo-in to win the Grey Cup this year. The Edmonton Eskimos are also in at 9-2. to two. They have a new head coach, Kay Stevenson, and a new quarterback, David Archer. They're followed by the BC Lions at 5-1. to one. The Lions are improved because of the addition, mostly, of running back Robert Drummond. Then come the Saskatchewan Rough Riders at 10-1. to one. They no longer have Bobby Jurison. And then the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Despite the additions of Ronnie Lancaster, Danny McManus, and Darren Flutie, they're 25 to 1. And at the bottom of the heap are the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Jeff Reinbold and company are listed as 35 to 1 underdogs. I'm told that the Argos have actually sold more season tickets this season without Flutie than they did the past two seasons when they had him. Go figure. I can't. And I can't figure out how in the world Louis Pasaglia is still playing football at the age of 44. He told me the other day that he intends to play for another six years or so. That'll make him 50, which is older than Chris Schultz and Eric Tillman combined. Oh, and by the way, guys, good luck in the studio. Take it from me. You'll need it. See you on Friday. All right, thanks, Marty. Marty taking shots at the panel already. He's only been gone for one game. And Marty will be with us every Friday night on Friday Night Football on TSN. All right, coming up, we're going to play some football. Alouettes and Bombers in Winnipeg. Local blackouts are in effect for those games. Mom. Hi. Can we order pizza? Okay. Time for McCain. Introducing new McCain Rising Crust Pizza. The new pizzeria pizza from McCain with a rising crust that bakes up fresh in your oven to deliver a perfect crust loaded with more toppings than ever. Great pizza. Where'd you get it? Oh, just a little place around the corner. New Rising Crust Pizza delivered by McCain. When I was a kid, lobster was a treat. As a grown-up, it still is. That's why I love the Keg's Lobster Summer. For a limited time, the Keg Steakhouse is featuring lobster in so many delicious ways. 
everything from a lobster and sirloin dinner to Creole lobster penne. And for real fans, they're even offering a fresh whole Atlantic lobster dinner. Now much like summer and my youth, things this good just don't last. So hurry in by July 26th. Welcome back. They're getting ready to go in Winnipeg, the opener of the CFL season, everybody. And welcome back to CFL Control. My name is James Duffy. If you're just joining us, we are all rookies here. A new panel, Chris Schultz, former offensive lineman in uh, Canadian and American League, and Eric Tillman, a GM in two stops in the CFL. Now, guys, we've gone around the league, talked about all the teams. Let's get down to the business of this game. Bombers analysis today. I guess the big question, TJ Rubley, is he ready to start in the CFL? Well, I think he is ready to start. I think he has the athletic ability and he has the background. And he's going to be able to handle the pressure that comes with starting a first game. Their offensive line has to play well. You know the Montreal Alouettes are going to bring linebackers, defensive ends, inside safeties, cornerbacks, and free safeties to get in Rubley's face. He's a big kid. He has mobility. First quarter critical for TJ Rubley, but you know, there's so many intangibles that open up with Eric in an opening game of the season, and this is just one of many. Well, this is going to be a physical game, big guy. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the interesting sidebar is the coaching relationships. It's too bad the two head coaches can't wear helmets. <laughs> uh, having worked in B.C. with both Jeff Reinbold and Dave Ritchie, I think it's fair to say that they're not on each, each other's Christmas card list. There was a lot of animi animosity back in the 1993 season. Interestingly enough, when Jeff Reinbold was hired by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Dave Ritchie was the other finalist for the job. There's no Nothing Dave would enjoy more than starting the season with a big win in Winnipeg and saying to the Winnipeg board they hired the wrong guy. All right, great. A little rivalry right off the bat. Now, enough talking. Let's play some football. Let's send it out to Rod Smith and Leif Pedersen in Winnipeg. Guys? All right, thank you very much, James. Hey, it's a trademark for the Alouette since they came back to Montreal, Leif. Great running game with Mike Pringle. But they've got more than the one dimension, especially this year, adding a couple of good receivers for Tracy Hamm. They really do, Rod. You know, I felt there's one area that they really needed to improve, and that was to have better balance in their receiving core. And here are the two receivers they've added. Eddie Brown, terrific career in Edmonton, a game breaker. And, of course, Matt Cody a couple of years ago with the Ticats had a terrific rookie season. You know, you lose Chris Armstrong, so it's a trade-off. You replace him with Matt Cody. The key is Eddie Brown. I think he's a better slot than a wide receiver. He'll start at wide receiver today, but... Clearly, Montreal now has plan A, the running, and certainly plan B, the passing. And if they are as balanced as we think they will be, Leaf, that's a big headache for Jeff Reinbold and his Winnipeg defense that has certainly changed a lot in the offseason. Yeah, it really has. And when you've got a young quarterback like T.J. Rubley, you want to have a great defense to rely on to maybe bail you out early in the season. But they have made so many changes. Shante Peoples was the key. He left. He was their leading tackler, leading sacker a year ago. And you see the numbers that they amassed. They were not a good defense they have to be better this year they've added some fresh faces in Joe Fleming and Maurice Kelly from BC and David Maeva linebacker from BC I don't know if it's going to be enough against Montreal today that'll be tough to tell especially the way the Alouettes look so strong they did in the preseason against Winnipeg uh, beating them with ease but this is the regular season and we're about to get it underway here in Winnipeg the opening kickoff is coming up on TSN <laughs> When the heat starts to bite, do you have what it takes to bite back? Gatorade Frost. Is it in you? If you can't get to World Cup 98, 
We'd like to point out that the preliminary matches for World Cup 2014 have already begun. And luckily enough, good seats are still available. McDonald's, proud sponsor of the world's biggest soccer game, and even prouder sponsor of some of the world's smallest. Ah, open wide. Uh-huh. Oh, yes, you're doing something right. Uh-huh. Less plaque and tartar. Uh-huh. Gums are looking very nice. You are doing something right. Uh-huh. Have I told you about Colgate Total? Uh-huh. It's the only one that works between brushings. Uh-huh. The only toothpaste that goes beyond fighting cavities to provide long-lasting protection against all these problems. Colgate Total, the choice of today's dentists. So, I should keep using Colgate Total. Pardon? That foot odor. Can anything stop it? New odor eaters insoles. Now with Arm & Hammer baking soda to neutralize sweaty foot acid, the cause of foot odor. No more foot odor. Only odor eaters has Arm & Hammer baking soda. <laughs> What's the best way to deal with obstacles? Eliminate them. That's why Dell deals direct with every customer. So nothing comes between you and exactly what you want. <laughs> Dell computers with Intel Pentium 2 processors. Got an appetite for success? Be direct, Dell. I don't take requests. I don't do encores, and no, it's not over when the fat lady sings. It's baseball, folks. And that's the ball game. Mets versus Jays, TSN Thursday. Welcome back to Winnipeg Stadium. You could not ask for a better day to start a football season and to play a football game, the Alouettes and Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And you can see quite a crowd on hand this holiday Canada Day and a, just a gorgeous one. 27 degrees Celsius and uh, just a moderate breeze on this artificial surface that will host the 1998 Grey Cup game. Dave Ritchie has been there before with BC and has to like his chances, Leaf, of coming back with this team. Well, I think he should. You know, coming out of training camp, uh, we talked about it in our pregame show. Uh, he is the odds-on favorite to represent the East here in Winnipeg in November. And, you know, I think he likes that role. I mean, he's a veteran coach. He's not worried about it. He's got a veteran team that can certainly handle this kind of pressure. But you look at this roster on paper. I mean, the defense has so many starters back, quality players. And, of course, the offense we've well documented throughout the last half hour. This is a tough, tough team to beat. It is an excellent football team that had a very good year last year. Four and 14 year for Jeff Reinbold in his first year as a CFL head coach last season with Winnipeg. Needs to improve and the talk around here is uh, the Bombers should be a better team this year with all the changes they've made. Well I think for Jeff you know he was a bit defensive yesterday in the press conference and he said look people are going to have to be patient. This team is not going to mature overnight and you know, I really agree with that and we'll see how they can play in their first big game. The Alouettes will kick off as Terry Baker is about to get the 1998 CFL season underway. Coming down for Ted Long at his 25, crosses the 30, he's got some room. Long out across the 50, and good field position for the Bombers to start off this game. Ted Long. Also a wide receiver for the Bombers and came over from Hamilton last year and played in only two games for Winnipeg, but was effective in both. You know what the nice key right off the bat, though, uh, Rod, for a young quarterback, T.J. Rubley. There you see him. This is nice field position out to their own 50-yard line. Good place to start for him. Taking his first drive in the CFL. He's been in the NFL and the World League as well, and he hands off for short yardage. Sean Millington, the ex-BC line who came across as a free agent with the carry there. T.J. Rubley has this arsenal to throw to. Larry Thompson and Chris Armstrong, who was with the Alouettes, won their top receiver last year. Up front, Dave Van Conant, the veteran center, and Chris Perez, excellent tackle for him. And Craig Hendrickson just came over as well for Winnipeg out of the shotgun at the 45. And throwing... And that one, intended for number two, Larry Thompson, well over his head. You know, in talking to uh, Jeff Reinbold about his new young quarterback, uh, he's, Jeff said, you know, he made some horrible throws in the two preseason games. 
but he made, he made enough good ones that uh, he, he showed some promise but you know there he had a guy opening Larry Thompson open and just simply overthrew him and I don't think anybody knows better than Jeff Reinbolt that uh, he's going to have to be patient they don't have a lot of depth at quarterback and boy in this league if you don't have the thrower back there it is tough to win and standing back inside his 40 yard line is Bob Cameron in his 19th season and still punting well gets a good one here and gets Chris Wright back inside the 10 yard line Wright with some nice moves he's a great returner he gets hauled down though good coverage as they get him inside the 15 after a 48 yard punt and Tracy Ham leading that Alouette offense again this could be his final year last year of his contract Won a great cup before with the Baltimore Stallions and came over signing on with the Alouettes. Of course, we talked about it. Leaf talked about it with Mike Pringle, great running back, but he has got some targets now with Matt Cody. In addition to Jock Climby back and, of course, uh, Eddie Brown over from the Eskimos and up front. The two tackles, Neil Fort and Azumo KK. CFL All-Stars last year. Great line. Which explains a great running game along with Pringle, but they passed to start off. And that's completed up for a first down to Mill Coleman. Well, the defense that Tracy Ham is going to look at today has a lot of new faces on it. A big addition up front was Joe Fleming from the BC Lions. He's a heck of a player. And of course, Grant Carter came back to the league, a former Montreal Alouette, halfway through the season a year ago. David Maeve at linebacker in the secondary. Got to love the name, number nine, Kwame Smith. <laughs> we'll start on the quarter for the Bombers this afternoon. First down. Montreal, they hand off to Pringle that time, and he fights his way. But four yards, we got a fumble. The Bombers say they have it. Winnipeg gets a big break to start this game. And it's one of the new Bombers, Maurice Kelly, coming over from B.C. to pick up the football. Well, as Mike Pringle cuts back against the flow, you'll see the ball gets ripped right there. Maurice Kelly rips it loose, and he's the Bomber that comes up with it himself from that middle safety spot. I mean, he's a former linebacker, and he's used to coming up and getting into the heavy traffic. He knocks the ball loose, makes the recovery, and a huge break early for this young Bomber team. He led the CFL last year with five forced fumbles, and he gets one there early on. A lot of pressure on Rubley and nearly completes it, although it looked earlier like he was throwing it away down near the Winnipeg, uh, excuse me, the Montreal 20-yard line. One of the keys this year for Montreal's front four is that number 94, Doug Peterson, usually plays on the nose, is now playing on the strong side where he's going to get a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. That time he beat the block quite easily and was in with pressure on T.J. Rubley. And when you look at this offensive line for Winnipeg, watch the left guard, Rob Robinson. He is a rookie, and he is going to have his hands full this afternoon. Out of the shotgun again on second and ten. It's thrown inside and complete. The ten long. Still on his feet, but loses the football. And Tommy Europe. The turnover for Montreal getting the ball back. Well, it's a good-looking play. The slot back screen to Ted Long, and it, it's well executed. He's got a little room, but he just can't hang on to the football. And it's anybody's ball here, but Tommy... Tommy Europe uh, is able to come up with the recovery, so both teams trade off turnovers early. So a good break for the Alouettes now after coughing it up on their last drive. And Tracy Ham will go to work again early in this first football game of the CFL season. Changing his call at the line and fighting the crowd in the process. And hands off. But Pringle has nowhere to go. The Lions, pardon me, the Bombers, I'm looking ahead here. Bombers front wraps him right up. Well, this is an ideal situation. Obviously, Winnipeg didn't want to give up the ball in a turnover, but when you play a team like Montreal that's so good at ball control offense, you really like to have them play on a long field. And, of course, uh, they're 100 yards away from the end zone here. And for the Winnipeg defense. This is a nice situation to be in. Second down, a little more than 10 yards for Ham. Slight loss in that play and throws it to Jock Climbing wide open. First down, Montreal. He's got more out to the Alouette 30-yard line. 
Gain of 18 for the Alouettes. Well, on second and long, the Winnipeg defense being very conservative. Their secondary playing a deep zone, respecting Larry Thompson on the outside. They just forget about Jock Climey coming underneath. And to Tracy Ham's credit, he has enough time to pick him out. And that's a pretty easy conversion on a second and 11 situation deep in your own territory. Winnipeg's going to have to know the situation and play a little tougher than that. Climey's a valuable receiver for the Alouettes going to law school while he plays football. And he airs it out again. Tracy Ham does. He wants Eddie Brown. And it is just over his outreached hands at the 50-yard line of uh, Winnipeg. Yeah, Brandon Hamilton is going to have his hands full covering both Eddie Brown and Mill Coleman this afternoon. Had perfect position. Uh, Rod, you and I were talking yesterday about these two Winnipeg corners, Kwame Smith and Brandon Hamilton, that often they are isolated in this very aggressive defense. And how would they perform? Well, Brandon Hamilton on that occasion had perfect position and uh, made a nice play. Where are you going? Second and 10 for Ham and the Alouettes. Inside the 30-yard line. He'll throw again. Good pressure. And they say no good. Bounced off the turf and into the hands of Jock Climey in what would have been first down territory. And to Winnipeg's credit, what they did was this time second and long, they brought a lot of people. Greg Battle coming from the outside right there. Watch him. He's not the guy that gets the key pressure, but up the middle, Grant Carter's coming. And this makes Tracy Ham throw it off his back foot. He doesn't have enough velocity on it, and the ball's incomplete. But to Winnipeg's credit, they changed up their strategy on second and long and got good results. One of the most important things to Jeff Reinbold, he was saying yesterday, Leaf, was field position. And so far in this first quarter, it's going to be working out well for Winnipeg. Terry Baker kicking about his 19-yard line. Gets a good one away. And standing back inside the 30-yard line. And good room. That's Irv Smith. Eric Blunt, excuse me, wearing number 21. Edmonton Eskimo and a huge gain for Winnipeg. They will have great field position. No score early in this one. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win $1 million. If your name appears, it means you could win $1 million if two kickoffs are returned for touchdowns in today's game. Now there's a million more reasons to shop at Safeway. Today's better way. We want you to speak up. Off the record, of course. Just look for the hotspot video display at a TSN Gatorade event in your community. And we'll videotape your comments to our Hot Topic of the Week. We'll feature the best comments Thursdays on the 11 p.m. Eastern Time edition of Sports Desk. Hit tsn.ca slash Gatorade to find a TSN Gatorade Zone event near you. Here's where you can find the TSN Gatorade Zone across Canada. When I was a kid, lobster was a treat. As a grown-up, it still is. That's why I love the Keg's Lobster Summer. For a limited time, the Keg Steakhouse is featuring lobster in so many delicious ways. Everything from a lobster and sirloin dinner to Creole lobster penne. And for real fans, they're even offering a fresh whole Atlantic lobster dinner. Now much like summer and my youth, things this good just don't last. So hurry in by July 26th. Right now, it's just a hunk of shiny wood. I'm a, I'm a hitting guy. But when he swings you know, it, I got a few hits with him. It's a hunk of burning wood. <laughs> just, just swing it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Expos, Marlins, TSN, Saturday. CFL Live on TSN is brought to you by Gatorade. Is it in you? And by the new Speed Stick Ultimate Antiperspirant for tough 24-hour protection. The Alouettes have the football, and it's Eric Blunt, the guy that returned the punt 51 yards to set up this great position, taking it inside the 20-yard line for Montreal. And that's a great call against the defense that they know historically likes to play zone coverage. Uh, let everybody drop off. Watch the linebackers get their drop. Tracy Gravely, number seven, on the right. He's getting deep now. Dump it off to Blunt. Give him some room outside, and that is a great call on first down, and they get good results. A second and two for T.J. Rubley. And the Bombers, they hand off. It's Millington and should have the first down. Based on his forward progress, as the Alouettes haul him back, and that is the indication. 
Well, I tell you, Stephen Reed, number 47, the outside linebacker, came up right in the hole. And although Millington picked up the first down, Stephen Reed took on a big back right in the hole and put a pretty good hit on Millington. Only Millington's strength got the necessary yardage to keep this drive going. Millington had his finest year in terms of uh, yardage carrying the football last year, his last with BC, and decided to sign on with Reinbold and the Bombers in the offseason. They take the handoff, and Rubley way back, and he's looking for Blunt, and he is hit by Doug Kraft at the same time. Perfectly timed for the incomplete pass. Well, a sneaky play that the Bombers try and catch the, the Montreal Alouette secondary napping, but Doug Kraft really left his man and came back. Watch the rollout, and this is a good call. Eric Blunt just tries to lose himself in the pack and then sneak out into the flat, but a very alert play by Douglas Kraft. I mean, this guy has been around the league. He's seen a lot of formations, a lot of plays, and all he did was react to the football in the air and use his speed. Second and 10, about the 20-yard line. Winnipeg trying to put it in and they get it down to the one no signal that the Bombers looking for that touchdown call Chris Armstrong the ex Alouette wants it but they're gonna put the ball right down by the goal line Well, you look at a team game here. Watch the blitz coming right up here. Watch the blitz pick up. This is the reason why T.J. Rubley has the opportunity to throw. It's Millington right there. Boom. He picks up the blitz, gives him the time to pick out his target, and that's everybody doing their job. And they punch it in that time. It's Sean Millington with the first touchdown of this CFL season. He rushed for over 800 yards as a BC Lion last year, but that's a critical yard for the confidence of this Winnipeg team, I would think, Lee, facing a team that's favored to go all the way this year. Well, you look at what they did off the great punt returned by Eric Blount. A few plays later, they take advantage of it, but the key was for a young team, they really executed well. Pick up the blitz, give their quarterback time to step up without getting hammered, make the completion, and then it sets it up for... The big guy, 6'3", 230-pound fullback, Sean Millington, to get into the end zone for the opening touchdown of the season for the Bombers. Jeff Reinbold wanted a good start. He's got one. 7-0 Bombers. I've known Paul since he's about this tall. Gord was quite a bit taller. I've known Gord and Paul since my 74 Pinto. Paul and Gord are a couple of real classy guys. Bingo. Bingo has been tall. We used to play sports together. I've seen him naked. I'm Gord. He's Paul. Why do you do all the talking? I've taken this car to Midas for everything. Car repairs should be no stress. If I want stress, I come to Bingo. Cars run in our family. Midas Car Care, the way it should be. Starting your engine is a terrible thing to do. But when you do start your car, there isn't an engine treatment in the world that can give it the kind of protection Slick 50 can. Because nothing else has Slick 50's unique chemistry. That's why Slick 50 engine treatment protects so well at startup and keeps on protecting even when you change your oil. You can reduce your engine wear up to 50%. What it takes is Slick 50. The Bombers take the initiative in this game against Montreal. A couple of turnovers, one for each team. A good field position for Winnipeg. A big punt return. That set up the touchdown for this guy, Sean Millington. Well, it didn't take them long to take advantage of the good punt return. You look at the, the two drives, the three drives they've had. They've started on their own 50 on the opening kickoff. Great field position after the Pringle fumble. And then even better field position after the... A punt return by Eric Blunt, but their play selection was good. The swing to Blunt, then they picked up the blitz, hit Armstrong over the middle. I mean, you know, this team, there's a lot of question marks, but they sure look pretty polished uh, in this opening quarter. No question about that is Troy Westwood kicks it off and sends Chris Wright deep into his own end zone. Wright going to his right flag down about the 10-yard line, and he's out of bounds about the 26.
And by all indications, field position will not favor the Alouettes again. Holding Montreal number 32, first down. Pushing them back to their nine-yard line. Tracy Ham has had to operate pretty deeply early on in this game. Yeah, you know, Rod, Rod as I look at the uh, Montreal Alouettes, and if I'm Jeff Reinbold, I mean, there's one guy that you don't want to beat you in this game, and that's Chris Wright, number two, their great kick and punt return guy. And You know, I mean, it's easier said than done. He's a tough guy to stop, but I think if you shut him down, you've got a great chance to beat the Montreal team. And Freddie Brown off the shoe tops and incomplete. Set up second and ten for Tracy Ham and the Owls. Uh, this is going to be interesting now. Remember, second and 11, they, they laid way off, and Montreal picked up first down. The second time they were second and, down, second and 10, Montreal, or Winnipeg got very aggressive on defense, and they didn't complete the ball. Now they're in the same situation. Got Montreal backed up. Let's see what they do. This time, Ham has time, and he has a complete pass. Up to Mill Coleman for his second catch of the day at around the 15-yard line, but still shy of a first down. Well, you're going to get a good half-field look at the zone coverage. They choose to lay off here, and Mill Coleman is at the top. Watch him. He's the receiver that's ultimately going to catch the football, but watch now the reaction. Everybody's coming. 29 is Don Robinson. He gets help from Kwame Smith, but that is understanding the situation. Heck, second and 10, we'll let him catch six-yard passes, and we know we're good enough tacklers to keep him short. And once again, the Owls and Terry Baker punting deep. Good pressure there, and the punt is not nearly as good. He had a 48-yard one last time. Heads out of bounds and in Montreal territory. Field position has belonged to Winnipeg so far in this football game. Well, if you're Jeff Reinbold, you've got to be pretty happy about the way this first quarter's gone. Yes, they've, they've coughed up one turnover on the on the fumble, but uh, you'd, you'd have to be pretty happy the way this quarter is going. And I would think with all the changes and all the questions, I mean, we have 15 new starters on this Winnipeg team. This is what he needs, really. Well, what he needs is to have his players have some confidence, and a, and a quarter like this is going to give you confidence because defensively they're playing well, and uh, offensively under the tutelage of Joe Powpow, who you just see in your screen as their offensive coordinator, they're doing a lot of things right. And they go to the running game again. Sean Millington straight up for about two yards. Jeff Reinbold said, for us to win, we need to run the football. Now, he's got three backs. He's got... Obviously, Sean Millington and Eric Blunt, but he's also got Pat McNerney, who was originally a tight end. Now, he's 6'4", 270 pounds. He will rotate. He comes out of the ballgame now, and Blunt comes in on a passing situation, but he's got three good backs, and I think he's right. I think they do need to run the football, and that's always been historic with the Joe Powell offense. Rubley out of the shotgun again, and he keeps it himself. Quarterback Braun gets close to first down yardage. He'd be maybe a half-yard shot. Well, he got the kind of defense that he wanted to to run a quarterback draw. It's the opening game. The adrenaline's still a little high out of training camp. Still a lot of vinegar left. But when you just get the front four rushing, as Montreal does, that's a good defense to run the quarterback draw. You try to get a block on the middle linebacker, Larry McSeed. They don't make the block, but Rubley struggles his way to awfully close to a first down. He doesn't have the mobility of a Doug Flutie or a Tracy Ham or certainly a Damon Allen, but he can run the ball. And Reinbold uh, talked yesterday, Leaf, about how they had scoured North America looking for a quarterback. It was quite an exhaustive search by the sounds of things. Well, it really was, and uh, he was on the Hamilton Tiger Cat negotiation list, and even before Hamilton signed Danny McManus, they chose to take him off, and as soon as they did, Winnipeg jumped all over it, and uh, uh, Cal Gibron, their player personnel director, said, look, you got to sign this guy. I think he's got some promise, and after a uh, stint in the National Football League with the Rams and the Bears and Ryan Fire of the World League, he ends up in Winnipeg of all places. The offensive MVP in the... World League of American, American Football, now NFL Europe. The he short is, yardage try on third down. He is not a pretty runner. I mean, that was not a pretty quarterback sneak. You know, I tend to think in these situations, when you've got Sean Millington at 6'3", 230, and Pat McNerney at 6'4", 272, they might be better choices than a guy that really does not run the ball well. Watch this quarterback sneak. I mean, this is not a lot of acceleration following the center like I mean he's just looking for a, for a soft landing there that's not an, a very aggressive quarterback sneak and if he doesn't pick it up which he doesn't it's because he wasn't aggressive 
Another turnover and maybe the first big break of the game for the Alouettes. As they take over on downs outside their 40-yard line. 7-0, Bombers leading. Hi, me again with my bits and bites. Sticking my hand in the bag and coming up with a different handful. Well, what do we got here? Three cheese bits, four spiced rings, and two pretzel sticks. Delicious. Next handful, whole new ball game. You can't get bored eating bits and bites snacks because your mouth never knows till it's all over. Bits and bites by Christy. Every handful is different. Yeah. Wimbledon Tennis Championships continues Wednesday and Thursday, TSN. It's about tradition. Some game to trip out there, man. Part of the game. The timing's off, you gotta sing. The one constant. And you dread the seventh inning stretch. The seventh inning stretch, our time to shine. Life can be cruel. In my Expos, mind, Red I Sox, TSN star. tonight. Of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world, she walks into mine. You'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon, and for the rest of your life. Last call. Sorry, sweetheart. I got a show to do. Last call on TSN. You don't have to go home. You just can't stay here. We've played 10 minutes of this ball game, and the Alouettes still have not got out of their own end, but this is their best chance, best field position to start at their own 42-yard line after they turned it over on down. Can hands off to Pringle. And he gets across the 45, a gain of about three yards. You talk about the importance of a running game, Leaf, and I think a lot of people feel over the years the CFL is largely a passing game. And Mike Pringle shows that you can run the football and have a successful team as well. Well, in Baltimore and then, of course, now with Montreal, he's always had a great offensive line that's been dedicated to, and a coaching staff that's been dedicated to running the football and has done very well. Hands under pressure, and they bring him down. It's Grant Carter and Joe Fleming. Fleming, the XBC Lion, another one of the Lions to come over and join Reinbold with the sack. Well, Joe Fleming uh, is a guy that can really get upfield in a hurry, and here's Joe Fleming right here. Watch how he gets up, and then when Tracy Ham tries to step up in, he peels around and will make the play. Look at that. Jumps over the block, gets back up and makes the play, and boy, that's what they're expecting to get out of him when they sign him as a free agent. Fleming had nine sacks last year to lead the Lions. And it's Eric Blunt with a flag down. This will be no yards. Takes it back to about the 35-yard line. A punt of 37 yards by Baker. Short return, and it's coming back further anyway. No yards. Montreal number 88. First down. Uh, another break, another 15 yards, and well, I'll tell you what, although they've had two turnovers in this first quarter, uh, Winnipeg should be pretty pleased. Gets out to the 43-yard line. You look at Dave Ritchie, second year as head coach of the Alouettes, third year with the team. Good guy to play for, player's coach. Can't play for Dave Ritchie. I don't think you can play for anybody. And the most that have played for him, yes, indeed, I've said that. He's got a good team this year, though they're trailing by seven, and Rubley's pass is incomplete. It's trapped by Armstrong up at the 50, and Torrey Hunter was close to getting his hands on it as well. Armstrong must be motivated in this, I would think, the leading receiver for the Alouettes last year. I would think in your first game against your former teammates, there's always a little extra incentive to do well. He's been a great receiver, Chris Armstrong. Three times over 1,000 yards. 72nd consecutive game today that he has played, and, and that is a true testament to his durability. Off the shotgun, Rubley struggles with it a bit, but finds 
Matt DeBook. And gets across the 50-yard line, but still no first down. DeBook with the Argos last year. And was going to fit in their scheme a little bit more as a, a special teams guy, a return guy, a la Pinball Clements. But Jeff Reinbold has found a spot for him as his starting slot back. Well, I think Matt DeBuck felt like uh, with Pinball coming back again and playing so well last year, if he wanted to be a starter, probably wasn't going to be in Toronto. Now, as things turned out this year with uh, Drummond leaving and injuries and so on and so forth, he might have had a better opportunity. But I don't blame him. I mean, you come here, you get a chance to start, I'd probably have done the same thing. He was actually born in Montreal, but raised in Florida. He's just a tough guy to find downfield at uh, five foot nine, and that might even be exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> Off the punt, and angled nicely by Cameron. Out of bounds at the Montreal 14-yard line, and once again, the Alouettes will be hemmed in deep. You know, in Bob Cameron's 19 seasons, he has never averaged below 40 yards uh, during a punting season. That's and incredible. Yeah, it really is. I mean, he's a good guy. And I would think for young players to be able to come into this uh, locker room in Winnipeg and look around and see guys like Greg Battle, Bob Cameron, guys who've been around for a long period of time, that must be kind of comforting, you know, to know that uh, not only does the organization have faith and confidence in a guy of Bob Cameron's age, but that... Uh, he can still contribute. He's at the point in his career where he could, his average punt could be around his age, and he could be happy about it. Averaging 43 and a half last year, the handoff, and another fumble, and the Bombers say they have it again. Upside. And an offside called against Winnipeg. So it'll be first and five for Montreal. You looked at the yardage of Pringle shown early over 1,700 yards last year. The top five performances by a running back in a single season. He has three of the top five, including number one over 1,900 yards of CFL record. First and five Alouettes, their own 19-yard line. They hand off to Pringle. Punches away for three or four to get closer to that Montreal first down. One of the key things that Winnipeg is doing on defense right now in their secondary is they are adjusting their corners and, and going to matchups. They've got Brandon Hamilton following Eddie Brown around. And they've got Kwame Smith playing over on Mill Coleman's side. So obviously Jeff Reinbold and his staff felt like that's a better matchup for them to have it. It's second and very short, which is a good thing because they don't get very much as Ham just keeps it over the top of the pile and should have a Montreal first down. I see the difference in the quarterback sneak with Tracy Ham and with T.J. Rubley. Rubley, I mean, was looking for a soft landing, and, you know, Ham is aggressive. He, he's trying to pick up, definitely pick up the first down. And it is a first down for Ham and the Alouettes, trailing by seven at their 25. Out of the shotgun, he's rolling to his right. And he finds Jock Climey in a crowd for another Alouette first down. That was close to being knocked by Reggie Carthon, a gain of 12. That's a great throw by Tracy Ham, rolling to his right, the easy way to roll and throw, and he picks out, he's got a three-man pattern with Jock Climey in the middle of this, and Climey hangs onto the football here, takes a pretty good hit afterwards from 29 Don Robinson, who came over the top. But to Jock Limey's credit, he took the, made the catch and hung on with the hit. The Owls at the 37 with a flag down immediately. Play action rolling and running out of bounds at about the first down marker. But a penalty has been called. Offside, Winnipeg number 91, decline, first down. So they do pick up the first down on the gain of 11 and an offside. It's quarter time. 
Let's head back to our CFL Control Studio in Toronto. Here's James Duffy. You're watching CFL Live, and we're at the quarter. Here's your host, James Duffy. All right, welcome back. You know, in the pregame show, we talked about all the offensive weapons that the Owls have, but so far the Bombers have disarmed those weapons. Eric, what exactly are the Bombers doing right so far? Well, James, two first quarter observations. I think that uh, Maurice Kelly has already demonstrated that he's going to be a real factor at the safety position for Winnipeg. Having a great athlete in the middle really strengthens your defense, a la Lester Smith in Toronto. The fumble Mike Pringle had early in the quarter created by Maurice Kelly. Secondly, off the top, we talked about offense and defense. We failed to mention a, a significant part of the game, special teams. Jeff Reinbold coached special teams at both Las Vegas and at BC. He puts a lot of emphasis on it. They dominated that area earlier in the game and that's been the difference in my opinion Chris well I think I couldn't agree with you more in the terms of special teams and the fact that they've had at the game but if I'm Charlie Taft the offensive coordinator for the Montreal Alouettes no problem stay calm cool and collected this is only the first quarter when you look at the fact that they only have a limited number of points they should have had another touchdown with these special teams opportunities that may as the game progresses haunt them in the end James all right thanks guys we'll be back at the half right now let's get you back to the game seven nothing bombers after one quarter of play let's send it back to Rod Smith and Leif Pedersen in Winnipeg. Guys, take it away. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Still waiting for the start of this second quarter. We've alluded to changes. My goodness, that's a close shot of us. Maybe a little too <laughs> close for comfort. We talked about the changes here, Leaf. Uh, the personnel, I get to come out to the booth, and James Duffy, but this is a new wrinkle as well. The mobile crane camera, what this does, and we'll have it at every game, in our CFL games this year, allow us much greater shots, visions of the sidelines. And, uh, well, the picture you see right here of the crane cam is, I mean, that's only about half the height that it will go to, and uh, we're going to get some terrific pit looks from that camera. It's going to allow me to draw uh, some pretty interesting angles uh, throughout the game, and I think it's a great addition uh, to our telecast this year. It enhances the perspective of the game, so sure well. sit back and enjoy a flag on the play as a quarter beginning and stopping right away. A couple of flags out on the field. Procedure, Montreal number 59, still first down. And it's Pierre Bercheval who spent his last two years winning great cups with the Toronto Argonauts and back home again. Happy to be back and playing in Quebec and with the Alouettes. And I'm sure we'll miss Toronto, but excited about the team that he has gone to. And Montreal emerging as the favorite in the East and a valuable addition he is to that Alouette offensive line. First and 15, Montreal from their 43 yard line. Wide open at the sideline. And it was intended for Eddie Brown. Boy, they really gave Tracy Ham a different look that time. Maurice Kelly, who is playing the middle safety for Winnipeg, came right up up in the line of scrimmage as a linebacker, which is a position he has played a lot with both Toronto and BC. And he was coming on the blitz. Tracy Ham saw it, but he just couldn't get the ball out to Eddie Brown. It's been a rough start offensively for the Alouettes. As they try again from the shotgun at second and 15. Ham with lots of time. Still standing and looking. And it's incomplete. Nearly picked off. Well, you've got to give the secondary full marks for that. Anytime Tracy Ham has allowed that kind of time to wander around, I mean, it's just terror for a secondary, but. You just see everybody is covered. He's got no place to go. Finally, in desperation, he tries to complete a ball to number 80, uh, Mac Cody, his new receiver, but uh, no way he was going to get it in there. That's solid defense by Winnipeg. Yeah, deflected by Carthon and Brad Elberg, the backup safety. In playing safety on that play, nearly had the pick. The punt return, Ted Long, inside the 15 and going nowhere after a 53-yard kick from Terry Baker to hem the Bombers back near their 10-yard line. Still a 7-0 score early now in the second quarter at Winnipeg Stadium. 
Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win $1 million. If your name appears, it means you have won Fill-A-Shave with Reflex Action. It adapts comfortably to the contours of your face. Closer contact for a closer shave. Fill-A-Shave from Phillips, our closest shave ever. Or the Business Navigator Personal Organizer from Casio with PC synchronization software and large one megabyte anti-loss memory. The BN10 packs so much power, it's like having a PC in your pocket. Enter your ballot at your local Safeway Food and Drug today. I've known Paul since he's about this tall. Gord was quite a bit taller. I've known Gordon and Paul since my 74 Pinto. Paul and Gord are a couple of real classy guys. Bingo. 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 We used to play sports together. I've seen him naked. I'm Gord. He's Paul. Why do you do all the talking? I've taken this car to Midas for everything. Car repairs should be no stress. If I want stress, I come to Bingo. Cars run in our family. Midas Car Care, the way it should be. the speed of the lightweights to the power of the heavyweights. Go ahead, knock yourself out with KOs and combos on TSN. Punch up the best boxing combination out there. TSN Boxing. See it. Live it. Defense, special teams, and turnovers more the story leave in the first quarter. Uh, certainly not great offensive numbers either team. No, I mean, consider the fact that Winnipeg had such good field position, they really didn't take advantage of it. I I like Chris Schultz's comment at the break where he said, hey, if you're Montreal, 7 nothing is not, nothing to worry about. I, I kind of agree with him. Yet to see that Alouette offense uh, explode, you know they can at any time. It's Winnipeg with the ball starting from their worst field position of this game, their first drive of the second quarter. Well, here, here's where you test out a young quarterback. I mean, this is the first real adversity that this offense has been faced with in the first half they're second and 11 from their own 11 yard line you don't want to make a mistake but but I mean you, you'd like to pick up the first down and I mean here here's where you start to earn your money as a young guy that was Eric Blunt in for the first time at tailback and comes out of the game after that one carry a loss of a yard second and 11 out of the shotgun is Rublin and he finds a man it's Larry Thompson at the first down marker Lines him up perfectly, right out of bounds, close to the 25-yard line for the Bombers. Now, I'll tell you what T.J. Rubley did very, very well as a young quarterback. You're going to see Peyton rush wide here, Peterson here. When Rubley comes back, he sees the lane. He steps up into that lane to get some good sight lines downfield. I mean, this is smart. See him step up. Now he's got clear vision down. He picks up Larry Thompson, and that is a key first down to give them some breathing room, but a smart play by the young quarterback. They spot it at the Winnipeg 24 as Rubley goes back to pass again and sets up the screen. Big Sean Millington rumbles up to the 30-yard line, and it'll be second and short again. One of the keys, when you run a screen, you've got to cut down the defensive end to that side. Watch Swift Birch. This is the guy you got to chop right here. They don't get the chop. They don't get him down. And he was going to end up, they get him down, but watch the reaction. There it is. But that's the guy you've got to take out of the play. If you don't get him completely out of the play, it's tough to have a good executed screen. Rubley will pass again. Swings it up to the side. It's Eric Blunt, but he gets stopped right away. Good defensive play for the Alouettes, and they do not get the first down. Doug Kraft with the tackle, and Winnipeg will be punting. Second big play with just plain reaction for Doug Kraft here in the first half. He sees the swing coming. Now he's off like a rocket. There he comes right now, reads it. And, you know, if he doesn't make that play, Eric Blunt had a lot of room to the outside, but... Doug Kraft, he, he knows situations. He uses his speed very well, and that was a good, aggressive hit to keep Blunt well short of the first down. Signed initially by the Calgary Stampeders. Played in the NFL with Seattle. An arena ball as well, and in 95 went to the Baltimore Stallions. Been with the organization in the move to Montreal. Bob Cameron, low driving punt. Shorter. Chris Wright takes it. Flags down for no yards again, and up to the 45-yard line. 
Well, Mike Pringle's been pretty quiet here in the first half, but it was interesting to talk to Jeff Reinbold yesterday. He said, you know, one of the games we played against Montreal last year seemed like for three quarters Pringle did nothing. Maybe he had 25, 30 very meaningless yards, and then all of a sudden on a counter, he went about no 60. And then Winnipeg the train... Number 19. First down. The train started to roll. So it took three quarters, but, I mean, you you never know when Pringle's going to start to hammer away. There you see his numbers, rather minuscule at this stage, but in the back of your mind, you always know he's coming. And that must be awful for defenders who are getting tired after a long game, and in the fourth quarter, he's charging like it's his first play. And, and he has the ability to do that on a warm day. He, he's one of those guys that gets stronger. Long snap from the shotgun for him, who takes it himself, looking for a man. Oh! Almost finds Matt Cody off the fingertips and rolls out of bounds incomplete. And I'll tell you, Tracy Ham took a great shot from Joe Fleming when he let that football go. And don't think that those don't take their toll over the course of 60 minutes. You're going to have a look at it. And Joe Fleming doesn't give up. Tyrone Rogers has a shot early but can't get there. But watch this. As the ball is released. There's a good shot by Fleming. And uh, those... Time after time. I mean, that can dampen someone's enthusiasm. It sure would mine. Yeah, I think mine too. Tracy M started the season with a knee injury. He missed the first preseason game. Played a quarter against these Blue Bombers back in Molson Stadium in Montreal last week. So hasn't had a lot of action in the preseason after having arthroscopic surgery. Airs it out deep, but too far for Eddie Brown down the right sideline. And once again, the Owls will be punted. And what they did was double cover Eddie Brown with Brandon Hamilton and Reggie Carthon, and it looked as though Eddie Brown may have a shot at that ball, but had that ball been better thrown, Reggie Carthon was right there. And I'll tell you what, uh, I mean, I know it's only 7-0, but uh, I'm certainly impressed with how Winnipeg has handled themselves here in the first half. Eight new starters on defense, so you can understand why Jeff Reinbold was saying we need a little bit of time to gel, but it looks like so far in this game they have been gelling on defense. Baker under some pressure again and gets it away. But Ted Long, the lone man back, who took it at his 20, and a little acrobatics for Long as he gets up across the Winnipeg 30-yard line after a 47-yard kick. It is still a Blue Bomber lead on this sunny day at Winnipeg Stadium. 7-0. And now, another TSN Sports Break. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the TSN Newsroom. The Toronto Blue Jays are giving Tony Phillips another chance, signing the 39-year-old to a minor league deal. Meanwhile, on the field today, the Jays are dueling the Mets. Toronto wearing their annual Canada Day uniforms. Woody Williams with the nod. Top of the fifth, tied to three. Familiar face, John Olerud. Bye. Three-run shot to right center. Olerud's seventh gives the Mets a 6-3 to three lead. But Sean Green in the fifth inning comes back with his own answer. He's at the plate. He cranks a two-run shot to right center. Green's 16th of the season. Right now, we can tell you they are tied at seven in the top of the eighth. NBA-related news today. Charles Oakley of the Toronto Raptors has been ordered to appear in court in Atlanta, Georgia, on charges of simple assault and battery after allegedly striking a woman at an Atlanta restaurant early on Tuesday morning. Details on Sports Desk. More football after this. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Van Horn, inviting you to join me for Sports Desk, your source for sports weekdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. That's Sports Desk right here on the Sports Network, ESN. It's about tradition. Some game to trip out there, man. Part of the game. The timing's off. You're out of sync. The one constant. And you dread the seventh inning stretch. The seventh inning stretch. Hard time to shine. Life can be cruel. In my Expos, mind, Red Sox, I am an old TSN star. tonight. It's a Canada Day treat if you're a football fan. We've got a doubleheader for you after this game. 10 p.m. Eastern tonight, 7 p.m. Pacific from McMahon Stadium in Calgary. The Stampeders open the season against Ronnie Lancaster and the Hamilton Tiger Cats. John Wells and Glenn Suter will be along to call that one for us. Uh, interesting, we've got the odds-on favorite in the East Montreal this afternoon and the odds-on favorite in the West Calgary. A lot of changes for second the second half of our double header. Right? Yeah, a lot of changes early for the uh, tie cap. See a completed pass to Matt DeBook. His second catch of the day and big yardage for Winnipeg once again. Gain of 21 yards. Yeah, nice combination pattern. Got three receivers to the one side of the field. They just get Matt DeBuck. Here he is. He just comes down, finds the open seam, and, you know, to T.J. Rubley, the ball is in the air right now, as it has to be, before the defenders show up in that zone. And, you know, that's nice execution by the quarterback. For the receiver, it's easy. 
find the open spot when you read zone and hope the ball is there, which it was. Alouette's pushing midfield at their 51-yard line. A big first down, excuse me, the Bombers. As the whistles blow and the flags come out. For a time count violation. Time count violation, Winnipeg number 12, still first down. See, I think they should say team. They always blame the quarterback for that. Maybe it was his fault. But I think on these ones, they should say time count violation, Winnipeg. Not to single out TJ. He's young enough and has enough to think about. Seem to be confused on something and looking over to Jeff Reinbold. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. And better to take the penalty. They decide as they hand off to Millington, who gets most of the penalty yardage back. Gain of uh, close to five yards. I mentioned the great year Millington had last year with the BC Lions, including a game where he had 212 yards against Saskatchewan. He wound up with 865 yards rushing, and that was his best year on the ground. Yeah, he also had 49 receptions last year. I mean, it was definitely uh, his career year in the CFL. He's had some good ones. Had 212 yards rushing in one game that uh, we covered on TSN last year. Flags everywhere. Uh, several of the Alouettes are stepping offside. Uh, Alfred Payton, 57, one of them. Although Swift Birch is uh, pleading his case that they were drawn offside. Well, here's Alfred Payton down at the bottom of your screen. He always cheats a little bit, but this time he jumps the count, and they catch him in the neutral zone. And after he moved, there was movement on the bomber's side, it looked like, that Swift Birch was complaining about. Alfred Payton could have had more money to sign elsewhere, and the CFL chose to stay with what he hopes will be a championship team. There's a lot to be said for that. Offside, Montreal number 57. Procedure, Winnipeg number 61. Repeat second down. So they do call both. Now, I remember talking to Tom Forzani, the great receiver in Calgary, about that. You know, he, he had year after year great numbers and everything, and he said to me, you know, I trade all those to be on a winning team. And so there is a lot of truth to what Alfred Payton said about it. I'm going to stay yeah. here for less money because I got a chance to go all the way. It's dumped off now to Ted Long, but he is going nowhere. Swift Birch wraps him up right around the line of scrimmage. Swift Birch has had a pretty active uh, first uh, half in this game. You know, he's played all over the place, tackle, and today he's playing in for the Montreal Alouettes, and I think that is his natural position. I don't think he has the weight to play inside a tackle, but on the outside, he gets to use his speed more than anything else. He runs down long from behind there, and he made a great play on the screen to Eric Blount earlier with his speed. This, to me, is his natural position. Then he had some competition from Tim Harris, ex-NFL star, mm -hmm. who ended up getting cut just last week in the final. That made Swift Birch a better player in training camp, I'll guarantee you, because Tim Harris is a good player, and I watched him play in a preseason game, and you could just tell that Tim Harris's work ethic from all those years in the NFL was rubbing off on some of the other players. Now, he didn't make this team, but I'll guarantee you he made Swift Birch, who you see in your screen there, a better player for it. And sometimes that's what you do in training camp. You try to bring people in that are going to push some of your other veterans. I know Eric Tillman back in the studio would agree with that, you know, as a former general manager. That, that is your, one of your big duties is not only to fill immediate needs, but is to bring quality people together Winnipeg. to make your Repeat people better. Always trying to improve the players and the team. Of course, it was a procedure call after the on the punt of Bob Cameron, so they're going to do it again. Moving it back five yards. Scrimmaged from the 45-yard line. Cameron standing back at his 31. Well, they've done a good job containing Chris Wright so far, but you always kind of hold your breath when he catches the football. That one bounces and takes a Winnipeg bounce and pushes Montreal down to about their 20-yard line. Alouettes hemmed in deep again after the 43-yard punt, and they're trailing by seven.
pressure test, we drained the oil from this car and added just this much Castrol Syntec. We then ran it over 160 kilometers per hour and waited and waited and waited. You see, Syntec has a unique molecular structure that bonds to engine parts, protecting them under the most torturous conditions. And if a little Syntec protects this well, imagine what a full oil change can do. Castrol Syntec Full Synthetic protects in ways other oils can. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to Win, and you could win $1 million or a 27-inch Zenith color television. A business navigator, personal organizer from Casio. The Minolta Dimage Pit Digital Camera. Corning's Revere Pro-Line Cookware. Or win a vacation trip for two to the Vias Vallarta Hotel via Air Transat, courtesy of World of Vacations, Canada's number one tour operator to the sun. Look for Nabob Coffee, Kraft Spaghetti Dinners. Now there's a million more reasons to shop at Safeway, today's better way. Rod Smith, Lee Pedersen, back in Winnipeg Stadium, the first game of the 98 season. Looking at Dave Ritchie as Alouette's trailing the Bombers 7 0 with 7.38 to go in the second quarter. Well, and his offense just hasn't gotten into a flow yet in this game. I mean, they haven't run the ball effectively. They really haven't thrown the ball effectively yet. And they're kind of, I don't know if it's the heat or what, but they're just kind of in a slump here. Mike Pringle on the toss, but that Bomber defense is something so far in this game. They've got. Last year's leading rusher in the CFL wrapped up for no game. And the key right now in the first half defensively against the running game for Winnipeg is they are getting penetration. They're not getting pushed back. You saw when Pringle had to cut up field to try and avoid the initial penetration. He was cutting up three, four yards in the backfield. And, you know, that's the key. Mont er, Montreal is not pushing anybody off the line of scrimmage right now. Pam airs it out. Out of bounds. Looking for Mill Coleman, but... Way overthrown, and there's another flag in the Alouette backfield as Ham is slow to get up. A late hit? Well, it could be. When they throw it that deep, it's uh, always possible. Winnipeg number 51, first down. And it's the ex-Alouette Grant Carter who came back from the NFL to sign with Winnipeg last year, getting called for the rough play on Tracy Ham. Yeah, that's a tough penalty, uh, you know, warranted, not warranted. Uh, I mean, the officials, they have to call those types of things. But when you've got a team backed up, hey, like a Montreal, right and you're going to get the ball back, I mean, this is a tough penalty to give up. Off the first down. Ham throws again, but it's high, and it's no good. And once again, intended for Mill Coleman. But it was Kwame Smith there to break it up. Now, that's the matchup they want. They want Kwame Smith on Mill Coleman and Brandon Hamilton on Eddie Brown, and they're rotating across the field to match up with these receivers. And, you know, this is a poorly thrown football, but Kwame Smith is right on the money to make the play. Now, he tried out with the Toronto Argonauts, made it to the final cuts uh, a year ago, could not make the team, and now he's got new life in Winnipeg. Three receivers wide left. Ham in trouble again, and just dumps it away, and a flag goes down. That'll be grounded. Ham had nobody in sight and just got rid of the football. Well, I don't think there's Intentional any questions. Grounding. Montreal number eight. Ham was down. just trying to get rid of the football here. Greg Battle, the final one to come in and put the pressure in. He's trying to avoid the sack at all costs there. And, you know, they're going to lose the ball plus uh, the yardage on that penalty. And because of that, it is third down and about a mile and a half as Baker will stand back inside his five-yard line. So the defense really bails out Grant Carter there on that roughing penalty, and uh, they will get the ball back. Pretty good field position. Another good punt by Baker. Eric Blunt, the lone man back for it, and he'll cross midfield. He gets inside the 50. After a 46-yard punt, but good work by Winnipeg special teams again. They'll have good field position. And the difference in this game right now, Rod, is, is the fact that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are a little more aggressive. They're a little more excited right now than the Montreal team is. I mean, on that punt return, every single guy in special teams for Winnipeg was hustling back. And that is a true trademark of Jeff Reinbold, who you see Gary Hoffman, the offensive line coach, came over from Saskatchewan. But simply, Winnipeg is the much more aggressive team right now. 
There's no question about it, and especially the work they've done up front defensively, as you alluded to, Lee. Putting on a good show so far for estimated over 21,000 fans here today. T.J. Rubley, he's got a man open. Larry Thompson, touchdown Winnipeg. They pick up the blitz on Larry McSeed and Stephen Reed. And one-on-one -on, -one on the outside, Larry Thompson beats Douglas Kraft. But the second time in this first half that Winnipeg, the offensive line, have picked up the blitz. T.J. Rubley's had plenty of time to throw. And he picks out the receiver for the home run. And when you have two linebackers blitzing, I know Rubley's seen it before in the leagues he's played. You know you have a chance for a big play. And he connects with a big play receiver, Larry Thompson. As Troy Westwood does what he just about always does, converts another touchdown. What a fine career he's had, and what a fine game for his Blue Bombers so far with a 14-point lead against a team that was clearly the favorite heading in. Yeah, and here's Larry Thompson up here, one-on-one -on -one with Doug Kraft. Watch the result. I mean, Larry Thompson, he's blitz, blitz coverage, and he makes a little move inside, and Doug Kraft bites. And that's all she wrote. When you bite like that against a speedster like Larry Thompson, you're in big trouble. But it's all set up by the running backs in the offensive line. Here's McSeed and Stefan Reed right up there. They're coming on the blitz. You got seven, six guys rushing, but nobody gets a sniff near T.J. Rubley. He can stand up, throw off that front foot, and deliver a strike for the touchdown. You know, T.J. Rubley is just loving that, his first CFL game. 44 seconds, one play, and a couple of catches for Larry Thompson today. And that's the first touchdown. He did not throw a touchdown pass in preseason. He just threw a whole pile of uh, interceptions in preseason. But So he must be feeling pretty good. I mean, it's a solid first half for this Winnipeg team. 14-0 Bombers. But uh, what Jeff Reinbold's got to keep these guys playing at the level that they've been playing at because this is a long game and a long way from being over. So... They have to work at keeping that intensity at a, at a high pitch. The kickoff return. Thomas Haskins, number four, out near the Montreal 50-yard line. Well, he's one of seven brothers, and uh, he is the youngest. So you know there was probably some pretty good fights around the dinner table, and uh, he looks like he, he made it through all of those. Four brothers played quarterback all in a row in high school, and uh, T.J., the youngest... I'm impressed. Now, you could really impress me if you could tell me his full name. Were you looking through the notes? I was. Theron Joseph. Very good. How's that? You Thank have you. done your homework. Yeah. Theron Joseph. I like TJ better. TJ works, especially <laughs> for football. Sure does. Especially for a quarterback. And the one that's been playing well today. Tracy Hand to Michael Souls, his first catch of the day. First time he's touched the football, and it is a good gain for him in the Alouettes inside the 45-yard line, a gain of 17 yards in Winnipeg territory. I don't know that this is a, a critical point in the game, but I think it's a point where Tracy Ham has to get some momentum for his team. The defense has been on the field a lot in this first half. It is a hot day, and that's going to take its toll. And the offense really has not been in sync, but uh, that's maybe the play that's going to kickstart them. First down. The Alouettes are in Winnipeg territory. Ham dumps it off for Pringle. Too far. Incomplete. It'll be second down, and Tracy Ham wishes he could have that one back. Boy, does he ever, because that's, you know, he's a good touch passer. I, I'd say he's a better touch passer than a guy that has to drill it in 25, 30 yards downfield, and he just kind of throws a duck there. This isn't a windy afternoon, and, you know, that's a ball that he should complete. You see it on his face there. And, you know, that, that's a play that nine times out of ten he's going to make quite easily. And you get Pringle the football with no one around five yards, and he, to look at the numbers, surprising start for him, but you give Pringle a little bit of steam to build up. He'd be a tough guy to bring down. Ham trips a bit as he's dropping back, firing again. Mac Cody would have been an outstanding catch. It goes off one hand and falls incomplete to set up third down Alouettes. Well, it was a good effort by Cody, but again, the pressure up front forced Tracy Ham to throw it just maybe a little before he was ready, and 
Although Cody lays out and uh, tries to make the play, once again, uh, this Montreal offense just has not been able to really come up with any consistency at all. So make that five for 16 for Tracy Ham and a rough start to this first game of the season, a 51-yard attempt for Terry Baker. Well, you know, the Winnipeg defense has given Tracy Ham a bunch of different looks here in the first half, and I think that, you know, one of the things you always say to Tracy Ham as a defense, you want to try and confuse him and not let him get in a rhythm, and Winnipeg, although they finally get on the scoreboard, uh, has really kept Tracy Ham off balance with some coverage looks. So a 51-yard field goal is good for Baker. And the Alouettes are on. Although I'm sure they didn't expect it to go this way so far. 3.54 left to go until halftime. I did ask Dave Ritchie, though, yesterday, Leaf, about all this talk and the headlines in the papers about Alouette's favor to win the Grey Cup, and he would have none of that. Well, I think Dave has to get used to that. I mean, look at Don Matthews in Toronto, what they've done for the last few years. You know, anytime you have Doug Flutie on your team, you're going to be the odds-on favorite. And, you know, I thought they handled that very well, very gracefully, where it had kind of a, a swagger to them in Toronto. But uh, that's all part of the deal. And uh, if I'm Dave Ritchie, uh, I welcome that because that means I've got a good team, and now I just have to coach them to, the, to that level. They were 12-6 and six two years ago, lost to the Argos badly in the East Final, but 13-5 and five last year, second best in the CFL, and came within a touchdown, really. They led heading into the fourth quarter and lost it by seven. Well, Terry Baker, unfortunately, missed three field goals that he probably should have made in that game, and uh, that was the difference. And, of course, Toronto goes on to beat Saskatchewan for the, the Grey Cup. But, I mean, uh, this has been a good team. They were a good team in Baltimore before they moved to Montreal, so... I mean, this is a good nucleus, and uh, they just have to put it together, and that's sometimes easier said than done. Baker, after the 51-yard field goal, kicks it off, and it's Eric Blunt, who's having a busy day returning footballs today. Having a busier run here. He's got some room left side, but a flag is down as he crosses the Montreal 35-yard line. And there are some indications that this is coming back. Holding, Winnipeg number 94, first down. You know, Rod, well, we see Jake Ireland uh, take the spotlight there, calling that penalty. Uh, it was really nice to see a great old friend of mine at the game today, Bill Fry, former head of the uh, CFL well, officials. I remember him. And you met Bill Fry today. Bill Fry uh, refereed the Grey Cup game that I played in in 1976. has been a good friend of mine. We inducted him into the Etobicoke Sports Hall of Fame a couple of years ago, and... Uh, he said he was in the Winnipeg area and uh, couldn't stay away from the ball game today. So it was really nice to see a good old friend of the CFL, Bill Fry. He's looking well, and, and to put it in perspective, anyone uh, that doesn't remember Bill Fry, what Jake Ireland is now to officiating, he was back then. Without question. Without question, he was one of the best. I was impressed that you remembered, uh, because, you, you know, you're a little younger than I am. Oh, not much. <laughs> and and uh, I, I don't want to bring up any sore points, uh, but I do remember that 76 great But you're going to bring well. it up anyway. But why not? <laughs> a close one between Ottawa and Saskatchewan way back then that he's referring to. It's short gain by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to set up about second and eight. But Jake Ireland, you talked about, is 19th or 20th season, I believe. He's had quite the career himself. And... Uh, Jake's going to keep this game moving because I know he's got a 6 o'clock flight to catch back to Toronto as well. So there's no fear of this game running late today, I'm sure. Rubley to pass. Second and long. Thompson comes back for it. And it is complete. But it is shy of first down yardage. About the 24-yard line. And that's where your receiver really has to help the quarterback out. And... Uh, you know, second and eight and a half or so. Larry Thompson's been around long enough that, I mean, you've got, if you're going to come back to the football, you better go 12 yards so you know you're going to get 10 in the first down. And now he comes up about a yard short, and you can't gamble back here. And, you know, although Larry Thompson uh, has been a great receiver and had a nice touchdown pass today, that's just something that really hurts your offense when you just cut those patterns a little bit short. 2.41 to go until halftime. They've issued the three-minute warning. 14 to 3, Winnipeg leads it. If you can't get to World Cup 98, we'd like to point out that the preliminary matches for World Cup 2014 have already begun. And luckily enough, good seats are still available.
McDonald's, proud sponsor of the world's biggest soccer game, and even prouder sponsor of some of the world's smallest. Welcome back to Winnipeg Stadium. Rod Smith, Lee Pedersen. An exciting way to start the season at the stadium where it's all going to wrap up in November. Yeah, and you know, I, I recall the Grey Cup a few years ago that Winnipeg hosted where the Toronto Argonauts uh, uh, won, uh, won that game. And uh, they did a great job for Grey Cup week, and I'm sure this year will be no different. And when you look at this game this afternoon, uh, I think for us as broadcasters, it's kind of nice that Winnipeg's ahead 14-3. to and. You might think it would be a good finish here this afternoon. Well, it's interesting. There's been a lot of talk about uh, Montreal will be the team representing the East back here, but maybe the Bombers are drawing a little motivation from that, that type of talk uh, so early on uh, in this game. Well, I guess what you have to like about a team that's made so many changes, not a lot of rookies, there's just a lot of different players from different teams joining this team, but you can never replace enthusiasm, and that's what they have right now in the first half, and that's the way they're playing. And I'll tell you what, enthusiasm can carry you a long way, and, and you're seeing evidence of that this afternoon. And if ever there was an enthusiastic coach, it is Jeff Reinbold. Come on, not holding, not holding, not holding. Off the punt. And already Winnipeg's been called for no yards a couple of times, and that will happen again as Wright takes off. More yardage on this one after a 36-yard punt. And a good return for Chris Wright after the flag. No yard. Winnipeg number 19. Decline. First down. Down to the Winnipeg 40, and all of a sudden, back-to-back -back possessions, the Alouettes, who couldn't get into Winnipeg's territory before, is enjoying good field position. You remember we talked early in the game about wanting Winnipeg, or rather Montreal, to have to play on a long field. Uh, they're only 40 yards away here, and this is not what you want to do. The special teams play. A factor in that last kick. And Tracy Hamill worked on the Winnipeg 40, and handoff outside goes Springle. He's got room and momentum, and he's still going. He's gone. Touchdown, Montreal. Well, you know, it's like, when's it going to happen? And it just happened after a short punt. And uh, great blocking up front. Neil Fort, the right tackle, seals off. And uh, Mike Pringle on the counter just follows his lineman around the corner. Yuzumo Okiki, and uh, he makes the play. And I tell you what all sets it up. Winnipeg tries to run a stunt with one of their linebackers on the outside, and I believe it was Wesley Leasy. When he went to the inside, there is no support to the outside, and that was a pretty easy trip and well-executed play into the end zone for Mike Pringle. And Baker follows it up to make it a 14-10 to 10 football game, and you give Mike Pringle some momentum, and he can kill you. Well, here's what you're going to see. Actually, it's Greg Battle on the outside. He, They have the support here, but he chooses to get caught up upside, and when Okiki comes around the corner, it's pretty easy for him to seal off. But see, Battle takes himself out of the play. He is gone right now. You've got no, no support to the outside. The receivers are running the defensive backs off, and, you know, to Montreal's credit, they saw it. The lineman read it, blocked it perfectly, and for Mike Pringle, a pretty easy trip into the end zone, but... You know, this is what makes this team so tough. They've been quiet, 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 and now all of a sudden, boom, he's got 50 yards and a touchdown, and, uh, you know, he's a force in the game where he hadn't done anything. Mike Pringle began the day 11th of the all-time list in CFL rushers. Over 6,000 yards. He was 100 yards shy of Dick Shadow for joining the top 10, and he's already got half of that, so he could be top 10 in CFL history after today. Ranked 10. Two other active players are ahead of him in Tracy Hammond. Damon Allen, but yeah, look at the numbers for him. It's an incredible career he has had in only, what, four and a half seasons? Yeah, I mean, he's uh, obviously he's a great running back with great skills, but he's been on teams that have been committed to the running game, and that does make a difference. You've seen a lot of good running backs your time as a broadcasting <laughs> player. You Here played with a pretty good one in George Reed. Well, Who's the best you ever saw? Well, you know, George Reed was great. George played for 11 years, and that's the measure for some running backs. You talk about durability and you know, after the kickoff, I'll talk a little bit about George because I had such tremendous respect for him. Another good return already for Eric Blunt because it was such a deep kick by Baker. And Blunt with another 25 yards returning. He started at the goal line. Well, you were with the Riders 
the 74 to 77, I believe. Right. George and Reed was still in the twilight of his career then. George Reed I played with for two years, and I guess, you know, it's tough to compare running backs, but George played for 11 years, probably averaged around 30 carries a game. He played so banged up and so hurt, he would not come out of the lineup. He would not miss games, and to me, that was a great measure of a great back. I mean, I'll tell you one guy I love, too, was Willard Reeves here in sure. Winnipeg. Big, strong, great cup with Winnipeg, Super Bowl with Washington. Uh, there's so many, it's tough to compare, but I have a lot of respect for those guys. T.J. Rubley passes and finds Matt DeBuck, his third catch of the day, and that's near first down yard yardage for Winnipeg, marching right back. Yeah, and I think that's the key, what you say, marching right back. You know, it's 14 to 10, Montreal slowly chipping away, and you know, it's it's tough in games to shift momentum. Montreal has momentum now, and if T.J. Rubley can do nothing more than pick up two or three first downs, reestablish some field position, you know, and now you get back to square one again. Nobody really has the momentum, but it's kind of a tough point for him. He, he's got to try to take something back from Montreal right here. And they're close to doing that on that first down within an inch of getting another first down. Uh, here's where you see if you want to be a gambler or not. I suspect with a a young quarterback maybe not but a little play action here is always uh, something that I have liked uh, I know it's your own 35 yard line but if you're confident in your short yardage offense this is a uh, this is time to take a gamble well you talk about the good old days of Willard Reeves and Winnipeg's always had a good big back they've got Sean Millington he goes in motion but T.J. Rubley keeps it himself and this time he does get the first down the last time in this situation they did not they must see a lot more in T.J. Rubley than I do as a quarterback sneaker because he does not do it in a very pretty fashion. But this is prettier than the last time because there is a one in that yard marker. <laughs> Still going their way. Yeah, right. Well, he is 6'3 and 215, and you'd, you'd think a quarterback with, with those physical dimensions would be able to do it, but and he, he's just not very aggressive following his center, Dave Vancona. About the 36-yard line. And he slips and falls. There was a lot of pressure on Rubley that time, and he is buried back at about the 32. Pardon me, inside the 30 at about the 27, 28-yard line. Well, Montreal turns up the heat a little bit on the young quarterback. You know, it is uh, first out situation. Swift berth. Nobody just lays a glove on him. Blocking mistake up front, and uh, T.J. Rubley does the smart thing and gets down in a hurry before he takes a huge hit. So a big loss for Rubley and the Bombers. He's passed well so far this game, and he's looking deep here. But Ted Long got caught up by a defender, Irv Smith, and uh, that falls far and away incomplete. And slowly, Rod, the pressure is starting to come. Swift Birch with the hit the last time. Watch the move here by Peyton. He takes the tackle up, then cuts underneath him with a really quick move, and that's one of his patented plays. He goes up top, takes the guard, rather, Ron Robinson, beats him to the inside, and although he doesn't disrupt the pass, you know, T.J. Rubley can really feel him coming, and as Tracy Ham took some shots early, all of a sudden, Rubley's starting to take a few hits. A quarterback's worst nightmare, number 57. And I think that's a very tough blocking scheme for the Winnipeg offensive line to do, where you block the tackle up on the tackle and you bring your guard out on a guy like Alfred Payton, you're asking for trouble. That's not enough speed inside by Ron Robinson. Nearly blocked by Nigel Williams. Cameron got it away and right with not much on the return. Just a 33-yard punt, but the... Net gain isn't too bad because Wright doesn't get much there at the Montreal 50-yard line. But once again, they'll start from a good spot. And the number's not too good for Tracy Hamm, although they've closed this to a four-point game. One of the adjustments that Winnipeg has made on offense or on defense rather this afternoon is they brought Brad Elberg. Uh, former collegiate running back star with uh, Queens, I believe, Queens Golden Gales. I think that was them. He is now playing safety, and they've moved Maurice Miller, number 24. There's Maurice Miller right in the middle of your screen there. He is no longer the safety. He's up playing linebacker, and he is a great linebacker as a converted defensive back. And swings it out. And it's Michael Souls, but nowhere to go but out of bounds after a short gain. Montreal native 
and is now playing at the stadium where he played his college football days at McGill and Molson Stadium with the Alouettes moving back there. I think it's pretty interesting. I understand they're going to have 18,000 plus for their, and that's, that's capacity for their opener, and that, that's pretty interesting. They have drew the Expos on the same night in an exhibition game. Eddie Brown with the catch, short of a first down. You know, a guy I'm impressed with is Brad Elberg. I mean, you know, here, here's a guy. Here he is right here. He's got to come up and take the third receiver. He's the middle safety. He's a running back. He's worked, he's worked hard to convert himself to a defensive back, and here he comes up and makes the play on a fast, slick receiver, keeps him short of the first down, and, well, you have to be impressed with a guy like Brad Elberg. I mean, you know, he could have folded the tent and said, hey, I'm a running back. I'm not doing this, but to his credit, he had a great attitude. And look, he's getting to play. He was a dominant running back in CIU football when Queens won the Vanier Cup. 31-0 over St. Mary's back in 1992. Tried the NFL in Philadelphia, but right. yeah, I mean, Jeff Reinbold talked him into it, and I think he is quite happy to be playing football still. Well, and we said, did he, we asked, did he accept the role readily? And, and Jeff Reinbold said, well, in preseason, we would let him run back a few kicks and punts. Right. He still touched the ball occasionally, and then we s slowly weaned him off that. So now he's a full-fledged defensive guy, and he, you know, he's getting that defensive mentality. So, you know, Jeff Roundball threw him a couple of bones early in preseason to get him on his side, and now he's playing very well. And what helped him? He's always been tough as a running back. He was punishing too. Is Ham keeps it on third down and gets the Montreal first down. A bit of a gamble for Montreal, but it does pay off. Well, when you've got this offensive line uh, that is terrific in front of you, and you run the option, I think the option in this situation is a great call. And you got Pringle out wide. As soon as Sam sees somebody come upfield, he cuts it up. And, you know, it, it's a third down gamble, but it's a pretty easy pickup. Well, of course, only 20 seconds left in the clock, so we're getting down near the half anyway. But a completed pass. Mill Coleman has the catch. And Kwame Smith on the coverage there. Gain of about six. You know, one of the subtleties in today's game is the, the tackling. I think both teams for the first game of the season have tackled very, very well. The, the corners and the secondaries have made tackles in the open field, and uh, I think they've done it, both teams have done a very good job with that. Stadium clock counting down under 10 seconds now. Alouette's running out of time, and Eddie Brown is wide open, but it goes by him. Falling incomplete for third down, and they said the stadium clock indicating two seconds left. Well, what, what wind is uh, in the park today is going to be a Terry Baker's back for this field goal attempt to end the first half. Terry Baker, 65% on the year last year, and uh, I don't think there's any question you would like to have him up at least over 70%. And he made that one from 51 earlier to get the Alouettes on the board, and this one will be certainly less than that around... Uh, 46 yards, 45, 46 for him. Heartbreaking for Baker, and you brought it up before because he's been a very good kicker over the years. Those three missed field goals that proved to be costly for the Alouettes when they lost by seven to the Argonauts in the Eastern Final last year. And what the, and what the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are doing is they're putting Bob Cameron back and Troy Westwood, guys. They can kick the ball out if Baker uh, happens to miss, which he doesn't. <laughs> He's good well, again today. Prepared. They were ready for it they were just ready. in case. And what began as a 14-point lead for Winnipeg has been cut down to one after Baker's second field goal. And the Alouettes are right back in it. We've got a great one to start the season here at Winnipeg Stadium, 14-13. Let's throw it back now to CFL Live Control. You're watching CFL Live. We're at the half. Here's your host, James Duffy. All right, not a bad start to the CFL season. A good, tight ball game out in Winnipeg. And, you know, I guess so far the TJ in TJ Rubley doesn't just stand for Theron Joseph. It stands for terrific job. He has been very impressive so far in the Bombers' debut. His first start, 12 of 17, 139 yards, one TD, and more importantly than that, no mistakes, no interceptions. And Chris, we talked earlier about his experience in the World League, in the NFL. This guy has been impressive. Well, he's been impressive to me. He's kind of a classic stance quarterback, but the one thing it looks like he's already developed and adapted 
is the fact that he has the ability to throw the out pattern in the Canadian Football League. There is a huge difference between the out pattern on the left hash when you throw to the right or throw to the left and the out pattern to the right. And if you watch him here, basically what he has the ability to do is not panic when pressure comes, throw with a nice velocity on a football. That's like a 40-yard pass, James, and not that many people can do that. And that's the transition part you want in your quarterback. Regardless of the hash, you have to complete plays. But overall, an excellent first quarter for Winnipeg. But, you know, I, I, it's caught up to him a little bit. Montreal's got the momentum back. Yeah, Montreal has, you know, really did take the momentum the last few minutes, Chris. The thing that I noticed in the first half, though, was from, from a Winnipeg standpoint on the defensive side of the ball, Jeff Reinbold's team brought a lot of pressure, and his corners and his halfbacks were able to play man coverage. That's what he's been known for. In the past, he's given up a lot of big plays. They didn't do that in the first half. But tip your hat to Montreal, James. I mean, they came back, they maintained their composure, and as Leaf and Rod talked about, it's a long game. It is. It's a surprisingly slow start, though, for the Alouettes. And I guess when Tracy Ham isn't working off the top, only 6 for 15 early on, you go to the other guy. You go to Mike Pringle, and that's just what they did. Down 14 to 3, and here is his simple little handoff. He gets outside. Great blocking. Seals the inside, and there you go. Watch the acceleration on Pringle. Chris, uh, this guy's fabulous. He really is, and the thing, the key about this thing is Michael Pringle wasn't even touched on the play. And whenever that happens, basically that's the fact that everybody is assignment perfect. And if you have the good assignment perfect on your blocks, if you get a big body on a big body, then it's up to the natural ability of the running back, and that's Mike Pringle, an experienced player. And you notice the acceleration had. You can just sense that he's in really good shape. I think with the running game, anytime you get a run for long yardage and a touchdown, that's like more gratifying to an offense because there's more people directly involved in the play. All right, thanks, guys. And, of course, this is just the start of CFL's opening day on TSN. We've got another big game coming up tonight, Hamilton and Calgary. We'll come back. We'll talk to Ron Lancaster about the new coach of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. He'll be with Lee Pedersen right after this. All right, welcome back. Well, you can't say Ron Lancaster is afraid of a challenge. He leaves a very successful program in Edmonton and takes over a troubled franchise in Hamilton. Our John Wells chats with Ron Lancaster. All right, James, same park, different team for Ron Lancaster. When you, when you look around here, you've been here a time or two. Yeah, we've been in this place a few <laughs> times. We opened here last year, and now we're going to open it again here this year. You know, sooner or later, you're going to come here to play. Why not right off the top? What impresses you most about what you've seen of your new football team? Well, we said we wanted to change an attitude uh, coming in, and the players did that themselves. I really didn't have to do anything. They came into camp with a great attitude. They've worked very hard. Uh, they realized, too, that we've still got a lot of work to do. But, uh, you know, for where we are right now, from where we started on day one of camp, we're pretty pleased. Defense, the strength of this team as it stands right now, it's, it's very solid, that side of the football. Well, when you can get Don Southern to come back and be the coordinator and all these guys except two, and that's Joe Hagans and Cummins played for him last year, that's a pretty good beginning. And they know that it's the same system, the same coach, the same people. They understand better. And defense is always ahead at the beginning of the year, and that's what wins for you anyway. On offense, a lot of uh, similarity for you with McManus and Flutie coming to the Tiger Cats to join you there. Yeah, well... I think any time you can have somebody behind the center that pulls the trigger in this league, uh, he has more control on the game in this league than anywhere else. Uh, I think it gives you a little bit of confidence going into the season, and we've had Danny before, and the players will rally to him, and uh, we're looking forward to the year. Yeah, have a good one tonight. Are you excited? You bet. So what a place to open in McMahon Stadium. All right, thanks, Ronnie. All right, and right now the Ticats, the long shot in the East. We saw the odds from Vegas earlier in our pregame show, kind of like our odds makers here. Eric, who do you like? James, I'm glad we had a first half to, 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 get, to uh, hedge our picks, but I do like the, uh, I think in the East you have to go with Montreal and, and Toronto at the top. I think it's going to be a very, very competitive race based on who stays healthy. At this point, I think you have to give the edge to Montreal because of their experience at quarterback. The other two teams, Hamilton and Winnipeg, both improved. I look for them to get six, seven, eight wins, but they just don't have the firepower of the top two in the East. Out West, Calgary, clearly the favorite solid on both sides of the ball very well coached two outstanding quarterbacks the clear favorite 
Between the next two, Edmonton and BC, I give the advantage to Edmonton because of defense. Saskatchewan, just too many off-season losses, Chris. Well, I, I agree with most of them. I think the number one thing for me is the fact that Montreal probably won't win the East. But when you get to the, the next three, I'm looking at Hamilton to surprise some people. I think Hamilton right now and Toronto are extremely close in, uh, in terms of talent and their ability to win football games. Winnipeg looks good this first half, but it's still very, very early. Out West, I'll, I'll agree with you there, Eric. Uh, Calgary, both sides of the football, very solid and special teams. Disagree in the sense that I think BC, this just might be their year. I like speed. If you have a chance to have the great wide receiver, slot back, and quarterback that can all run, you're going to win football games. Edmonton, we're not sure about. Perhaps in three or four weeks, we'll be much clearer as to their abilities. And Saskatchewan, I think they're going to struggle throughout the year. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And just for the record, I still like Ottawa. 14-13 <laughs> is our score at the half. And remember, this is just the beginning. We have a doubleheader on TSN today. Coming up tonight, Hamilton and Calgary at McMahon Stadium. 10 o'clock, the kickoff for that one. Go to the fireworks, come back, watch some football on TSN. Hi, me again with my bits and bites. Sticking my hand in the bag and coming up with a different handful. Well, what do we got here? Three cheese bits, four spiced rings, and two pretzel sticks. Delicious. Next handful, whole new ball game. You can't get bored eating bits and bites snacks because your mouth never knows till it's all over. Bits and bites by Christy. Every handful is different. Yeah. <laughs> When the heat starts to bite, do you have what it takes to bite back? Gatorade Frost. Is it in you? If you like action. Welcome to the Johnny Bauer exhibit. You'll love the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's fun, it's surprising, it's interactive. And now with the world of Hockey Zone, it's so much fun, you won't know what hit you. Centuries ago, the humble potato was praised for its nutrition and worshipped for its delicious taste. Discover the new golden standard that's making modern history. Introducing McCain Home Fries. All the deep fried flavor of your favorite fry. Crispy outside, moist potato flavor inside. Crispy McCain Home Fries. They could change history. Taste it and believe it. All right, a bit of a surprising start to our first game of the CFL season. Winnipeg leading Montreal 14-13 at the half. A couple of big plays, but this was the biggest one of the first half. T.J. Rubley, young quarterback. Well, this make, makes it look pretty easy right here. Larry Thompson gets behind Doug Kraft, and that's about as easy as they come, folks. That's a 50-yard touchdown, giving Winnipeg a 14-0 league. As we said, the Owls have come back. It is now 14-13. And Jeff Reinbold had to be feeling pretty good about the way they started getting that 14-0 lead, but... It's a little bit closer now. Here's what Reinbold had to say as he walked off after the first half. Yeah, we, we let some momentum get out of us at the end of the half. We, we made them kick off because a lot of their defensive players are on a kickoff team trying to get another 50-yard sprint out of their legs. And then we go get a dumb hold, holding call by a rookie. Then we punt the ball and don't punt it well, and it's a short field. And one play, it's in the end zone. That's what these guys can do to you. For us to hang on and win the football game, we got to take advantage of the opportunities they're giving us offensively, and we can't give up any more big plays. All right, quick, quickly, guys, what do the, these teams have to do in the second half? Well, I think Winnipeg right now, they have to have some sort of confidence that they had such a first quarter. Actually, reproduce the, third, the first quarter into the third quarter in your terms of your execution there. Quickly. Montreal, in order to win, has to run the football more effectively, James. All right, pretty good half of football here. 14-13, Winnipeg leading Montreal. We'll be back for the second half in just a minute. This sports break is brought to you by the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. For great steaks, good friends, see you tonight.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the newsroom. Get you back to football in a minute. Some disturbing NBA-related news to pass your way. Charles Oakley of the Toronto Raptors has been ordered to appear in court in Atlanta, Georgia. Oakley was not arrested, but was issued a copy of charges to appear in court on charges of simple assault and battery after allegedly striking a woman at a Northwest Atlanta restaurant they call the Waffle House early Tuesday morning. Court date is unknown at this time. Big day on the network tonight as the Montreal Expos visit Fenway to tangle with the Boston Red Sox. Dustin Hermanson faces Brett Saberhagen it all gets underway 7 eastern 4 p.m pacific game just underway or actually late in the stages at sky dome this afternoon the mets are trading the blue jays 12 to 8 they are now in the eighth inning of play the world cup takes two days off until the quarterfinals on friday sports says coming your way at 6 30 eastern back to football after this ah open wide uh -huh. oh yes you're doing something right uh -huh. less plaque and tartar uh -huh. Gums are looking very nice. You are doing something right. Have I told you about Colgate Total? It's the only one that works between brushings. The only toothpaste that goes beyond fighting cavities to provide long-lasting protection against all these problems. Colgate Total, the choice of today's dentists. So, I should keep using Colgate Total. Pardon? Rod Smith, Lee Pedersen back in Winnipeg where the halftime stats are brought to you by Adidas, the official sponsor of the Canadian Football League. And Lee, stats for the most part very close in net yards. Uh, one interesting note for the Bombers. Well, uh, you know, Jeff Reinbold told us that in order to win the football game, he was going to have to run the ball effectively. They only have 26 yards. I still think they have to run it more effectively. And I think Eric Tillman back in the studio is correct that Montreal, too has to run the ball a little more effectively. I mean, here we are, 14-13. It's uh, pretty much a tie game, and I think the team that probably does the best on the ground in the second half is probably the team that's going to win this football game. Obviously, error-free comes into it, but the running game, I think whoever does it best will win. Certainly, momentum belongs to the Alouettes. They've scored 13 straight to make it a one-point game. Taken by Ted Long off the kickoff. Flag on the play over the 40-yard line. So the flags come out again, and some early indications that they'll be marching the Bombers back a little Illegal further. Illegal block. Winnipeg number 51. First down. Grant Carter, the ex-Alouette, called on that penalty. And they'll go back and start. Rubley will from the 25. Well, so far... The veteran has got to give way to the rookie in this game. Rubley's played well. He really has. Uh, you know, talking to some people in the press box here at halftime, I think everybody was pleasantly surprised at how comfortable he looked in the pocket. And he's handed off to Sean Millington again, who picks up a few yards up to about the 27-yard line. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with uh, T.J. Rubley in the first half, and now Joe Pow Pow is uh, giving him a little help. They send in Spencer McLennan, number 18, take Pat McNerney, the running back, out, send in a play from the bench, and try to take a little pressure off the young quarterback. There's Joe Pow Pow, and, you know, historically in the offenses that he has run, they have been running teams as well, and I know he'd like to be able to do that with this club. Reinbold was an assistant to Pow Pow and BC. They reverse rolls here. It's picked off by Tracy Gravelin. Could be gone. They catch up with him and knock him down near the 10-yard line. And it's the first critical mistake of the game for T.J. Rublin. Well, the way the ball was delivered, it almost looked like his arm was hit or tipped or something. And I'm just wondering if Doug Peterson didn't get an arm up. Peterson, number 94, right in the center of your screen. I think he tips it just a little bit, and Tracy Gravely is able to uh, get the interception. But here it is, right there. The hand is up. No question. Doug Peterson gets the tip. All the velocity is lost, and Tracy Gravely comes up with the key interception on this opening drive of the second half. What a play it is, certainly. A huge turnover for the Alouettes to give them deep field possession inside the 15-yard line. Flags down, right with the snap of the ball. The pass is completed and down near the end zone. It was Matt Cody on the reception. But the officials discuss past the line of scrimmage. Offside, Winnipeg number 24, declined. 
First down. So the Alouettes are knocking on the door to take their first lead in this ball game. Well, the good teams usually take advantage of their opportunities, and this is an enormous one. Uh, after a 14-0 lead by Winnipeg, Montreal has been just chipping away and now has a terrific opportunity to take their first lead of the afternoon. Ham settles in and hands off to Pringle. And Mike Pringle has his second touchdown of the game. And the Alouettes have their first lead. And yeah, not too many times in the one-yard line are you going to stop Mike Pringle with this big offensive line. And the key, as always, is the lead block from Michael Souls. You're going to see Souls come and kick out on David Maeva, and that's the key for Pringle to cut back inside. There's the kick-out block right there. Pringle, usually on the goal line, you have to run over one person to get in. He does that. Pretty easy trip. See how low he gets under his shoulder pads. I mean, he is a tough guy, almost impossible to stop dead in his tracks. When you look at his numbers, five foot eight and 186 pounds, it's amazing that someone of that size can generate that much power against big linebackers, but he certainly can. Well, the key is, you know, the key is right here. Here's Michael Souls. Whichever way he makes his block, that means Pringle's going to either cut inside or go outside. In this case, Pringle goes inside. He knows there's not enough blockers up front to get everybody, and he runs over Colin Scribner with the shoulder down and, you know, gets into the end zone. But his key is the lead block from Souls, and, boy, nine times out of ten, Souls gives him a solid effort. And the tip by Doug Peterson, but the first mistake by T.J. Rubley proves to be costly for Winnipeg. Well, I mean, I don't call it Rubley's mistake. He, the ball was tipped. I mean, what are you going to do as a quarterback? Certainly on your, it's reflected on your statistics for the afternoon, but a tipped ball, I mean, that's just one of those unfortunate things, and uh, we'll see how he regroups on, on this next drive. All the games last year between these two teams were close, even though the Alouettes clearly had a better club, finishing 13 and 5 as opposed to 14 and, or 4 and 14 for Winnipeg. But the differential in the four games were seven points, five points, three, and one point. That's how close Winnipeg played. Well, some teams you always just seem to play well against, and for Winnipeg, yeah, although they're not the quality, don't have the quality that Montreal does, they just play them tough. Ted Long on the kickoff from Terry Baker and gets it up near the 35-yard line where the Bombers will start again. This uh, is a challenge now for Rubley, as it's going to be for probably the entire second half on every possession. I mean, the worst thing you want to do is to give the ball back quickly to Tracy Ham and his offense. They're come back with 20 straight points now, and, you know, if Winnipeg's going to win this game at some point, they've got to step up, and uh, I think right now is a pretty good time. Trailing in the ball game for the first time, it will be interesting to see how the Bombers do respond. A man down, being tended to by the Bombers medical staff right now. And, and that's not good to have Ted Long down uh, because Jeff Reinbold's team is very thin at receiver. He says he's happy with his receiving core, but I really can't believe you'd be happy with Ted Long and Matt DeBuck as you're starting wide receiver and slot back to one side. I can see Larry Thompson and Chris Armstrong on the other side, but this team is thin at receiver and they can't afford to lose anybody let alone Ted Long right here and the man you alluded to before another ex Alouette Spencer McLennan number 18 is heading towards the huddle now and obviously filling in for Ted Long he is the only extra receiver that the Bombers have yeah, they, they are thin here Jeff knew it but he's going to have to live with it he just did not have anybody better in training camp so this is with the hand they dealt themselves so the Bombers Hope Ted Long isn't hurt too badly. He's still on the field. We'll take a break and be right back after this. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win $1 million. If your name appears, it means you have won Dirt Devil MVP Swivel Glide Vacuum with patented rear swivel casters and the Ultra Handbag with onboard tools. Dirt Devil, powerful vacuums that are incredibly easy to use. Or a Zenith 27-inch digital-ready stereo television with 530 lines of resolution, universal night vision glow-in-the-dark remote, and SEQ front surround sound. Zenith Entertainment, just like they like it. Enter your ballot at your local Safeway Food and Drug today. When I was a kid, lobster was a treat. 
As a grown-up, it still is. That's why I love the Keg's Lobster Summer. For a limited time, the Keg Steakhouse is featuring lobster in so many delicious ways. Everything from a lobster and sirloin dinner to Creole lobster penne. And for real fans, they're even offering a fresh whole Atlantic lobster dinner. Now, much like summer and my youth, things this good just don't last. So hurry in by July 26th. in Winnipeg, some concern on the Bombers bench. You're looking at Ted Long, who was injured on the kick return after uh, Montreal went ahead. That Pringle touchdown. He's favoring, I believe, his right leg. And as Leaf alluded to, some big concerns for Jeff Reinbold and company, not very deep at the receiver spot. Spencer McLennan is in for Long. The backfield is empty. Rubley is throwing. And it falls short of Larry Thompson, incomplete. Yeah, and he's upset with himself, T.J. Rubley. I mean, that's a ball that he, he could have completed. Uh, zone coverage, soft coverage by Doug Kraft out on Larry Thompson. Thompson wide open, but uh, Rubley just wasn't able to get it in there. Lots of time to throw. Good protection up front. For the most part, that bomber line has been doing a pretty good job giving Rubley some time to throw the football. Well, I agree with you. Another passing situation here. He clears the pocket and throws to the left, and Thompson has it. He comes back for it, turns around, and gets the first down. Is that the kind of help you were talking about? That is the kind of help. I mean, Larry Thompson initially looked like he had the first down, lost it trying to pick up some more yards, and then at the last second, you could just tell that he was saying to himself, I've got to dive for a couple more yards, get this first down, keep the drive going, but here he's got it. Now he loses it. Now he gets it back, and uh, that's pretty heads-up play by Larry Thompson. And, you know, that is a big catch. They, they need, as we talked about, to get some momentum back in a few first downs. They hand off this time to Eric Blunt. In it, running back. Got some room, and up near another first down for Winnipeg. Bombers are moving this footballer at midfield. This is a great run by Eric Blunt. When you run the counter, sometimes it takes a a long time to develop and that allowed Doug Peterson to get up field quickly there you see it and Blunt just breaks the tackle in the backfield I mean you're looking at a five yard loss there that he turns into uh, a big nine plus yard gain and that's just sheer athletic ability by Eric Blunt because Peterson had him dead in his sights picked up 672 yards last year in his final year with the Eskimos and the short yardage and Rubley again and another Winnipeg first down the sticks will move and that was a better quarterback sneak. Yeah, he's getting better. He is. He's improving. And he's had some business today with quarterback sneaks. I think that's about his third. The other two in third and short yardage situations. Interesting here. This is the first time they've gone to the hurry up today. And uh, sometimes that's a good way to try and change the flow of a game. First and ten Winnipeg. They're into Al's territory now. They hand off the blunt again. Right side. And he's got about three or four yards. We mentioned the uh, injury to Ted Long, and we have an update uh, now. Let's head down to the sideline and join Greg Musselman. Greg? Okay, I just talked to Ted Long a couple of moments ago. He got hit in the, uh, well, very delicate area, in the groin area. Uh, he smiled, says he's okay, and should be back very soon. In fact, a moment ago, he was just jogging up and so uh, down the sidelines. But he will be back in there. Thank you, Greg. Leaf, it's nice to know he can smile after something like that. That's right. Flags are down on the field. To look at Procedure, Doug Peterson. Winnipeg number 66, still second down. Big Mike Mahalik called for a legal procedure to push it back to his second in about 12 yards. Rubley airs it out of 
bit too far. He had a man in Chris Armstrong, but just out of his reach, standing down inside the 25. But, you know, you get a few opportunities against the Blitz uh, throughout a game to try and hit the home run. And here is Chris Armstrong right in the middle. They got three receivers to that side of the field. And, you know, tight coverage, press coverage up front against Harold Nash. And Armstrong is by him. He just can't catch up to the football. Uh, the bad news is they don't make the play. The good news is, as a quarterback, we read this. the situation right. He went to the right area. He just didn't complete the pass. But, I mean, when you go back and look at it on film, you have to say, look, we did the right thing. Good punt by Cameron after picking it up off the turf from the snap and nowhere to go for Chris Wright on the return. It's the Alouette football, and the Alouette lead by six. Back after this. You're never too young or too old to enjoy the fresh squeezed taste of McCain Premium Frozen Concentrated Orange Juice. McCain uses the concentrated juice of 14 premium oranges in every can, 100% pure juice. It also comes in three more refreshing and nutritious orange varieties for your family to enjoy. Here's to happiness, life, and family. From McCain. Pop quiz. Who's the number one iron in PGA Tour wins? Mizuno. Who's the number one iron in PGA Tour money winnings? Mizuno. Who's the number one iron on the PGA Tour? Mizuno. So what can you learn from the best players in the world? That if you're serious about winning, Mizuno Tezoid irons are the right answer for you. Take the Tezoid Pro Forged Iron a forgiving forging that gets straight A's for feel and control. Play to win. Play Mizuno. It's called Big Time Sports, all summer long on TSN. CFL Live on TSN is brought to you in part by Midas Car Care, the way it should be. The Alouettes have the football, but they are deep in their own zone after an illegal block by Hensi Charles of Montreal pushes them back even further starting just inside the nine yard line they're up by six and Ham hands off to Mike Pringle who is going nowhere and more flags on the field he's buried for a loss down to the five yard line Winnipeg uh, getting very aggressive against the run deep down in Montreal territory. Flag down, and I have to believe they got part of the face mask on the tackle there. It Major looked as though David Maeva did. Mask. Winnipeg number 34, first down. Well, it was Greg Battle, and uh, again, that's a tough penalty. You remember earlier in the game, Grant Carter on a second down play took a roughing penalty to get Montreal out of trouble. Now this face mask, 15 yards, when you had Mike Pringle stuffed in the backfield. It, these are tough penalties to take when you're when you're struggling and trying to win a football game. And that is a big break for the Alouettes. They come out about the 23-yard line, close to the 24, and a first down. A big difference from what they were just in. And big Michael Souls rumbles up the middle, and he should have another Montreal first down. Up around the 35-yard line, the sticks will move again. Well, I don't think Montreal is not thinking, you know, hey, we got a break, got the penalty, we are out, got a little breathing territory. Let's just start hammering away at Winnipeg. Let's wear them down. Dave Ritchie, that's what he's thinking. Let's wear these guys down. We're almost halfway through the third quarter. We can take control of this game and not let Winnipeg back in. And to allude to something you said earlier, the danger, and Jeff Reinbold realizes this with Montreal is every play, second half, fourth quarter, they can continue to pound on you as Pringle gets short yardage again. You can never take a break against them. That was Reinbold's big concern. Well, they, they, can, they can wear you out in a hurry. 
Wesley Lisi is the linebacker out here. He's going to be on the hot seat on the option. And when Tracy Ham comes out, watch how he strings it out, strings it out, keeps going out. And when Ham is forced to pitch it, he is in perfect shape to make the tackle. And that is terrific execution on defense against the option. And Lisi is a newcomer, and uh, he really made an excellent play. Second and long for Ham and the Alouettes now. Looks for Milt Coleman and has him, but because he had to come back for it, he is short of the first down. And that's about the third good tackle Kwame Smith has made to keep a receiver short of the first down. And, you know, they may gamble here, but I'll tell you, Kwame Smith did his job in making that tackle because that was a blitz situation, one and one, and Coleman had a lot of field to work with. And he keeps them, he puts them into a punting situation. You know, you look at the little things and the little contributions throughout a game that players make, and that was a big contribution by Kwame Smith right there. So Baker will punt again inside his 30-yard line. Watch, Bomber ball. defense gets the job done. standing and coming closer to his 30 now to take it on the bounce, which he does. Blunt, nowhere to go, wrapped up at the 28. And that's where the Bombers will begin again, down by six. And Provo with the tackle. After the 39-yard punt, Dwayne Provo. T.J. Rubley He's had a pretty good game for his first crack of this. He didn't play all that well against Hamilton in exhibition game they won. That was Jeff Reinbold's assessment, but thought he did improve, looked better in the exhibition game against the Alouettes. It's what he's looking for, to make steady improvements, and completes that pass there to Larry Thompson. That may be the best throw he's made all day. I mean, he hit Chris Armstrong nicely on a post, but... Uh, yeah, that was a pretty good throw right there. A lot of zip on it. He's six foot three, stands tall, and uh, when he steps up on that front foot, he has a lot of leverage, and uh, that was that got to Thompson in a hurry, which that kind of pass has to do, or it's it's just no good. Sets up a second and five. And really to throw again, and nearly intercepted. Torrey Hunter was the closest man to the ball, and it just hit his hands and fell out. I think Chris Armstrong slipped a little bit as he was running that hook into the middle, and Rudely threw it to where he thought he would be, and you have to do that as a quarterback. You have to have confidence that your receiver is going to get to that spot, and Chris Armstrong just slipped a little bit, and it wasn't Rudely's fault. Uh, Armstrong just couldn't stay on his feet. But those are the kind of plays that can all of a sudden go the other way in a hurry. When your receiver falls down... <laughs> Well, he's been intercepted earlier in this game. But that, as you pointed out, after a deflection by uh, Doug Peterson at the line. And a nice laser punt by Bob Cameron. Chases right inside his 20. Good coverage by the Bombers as well, and the crowd getting fired up with the 58-yard punt by Cameron. 20-14, to 14, Alouettes. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to Win. If your name appears, you want a fabulous trip for two to part of Vallarta, Mexico. You'll stay at the VS Vallarta Hotel and fly Air Transat, all courtesy of World of Vacations, Canada's number one tour operator to the sun. Million Dollar Touchdown to Win at Safeway Food and Drug. I've known Paul since he's about this tall. Gord was quite a bit taller. I've known Gord and Paul since my 74 Pinto. Paul and Gord are a couple of real classy guys. Bingo. Bingo. Oh, we used to play sports together. I've seen him naked. I'm Gord. He's Paul. Why do you do all the talk? I've taken this car to Midas for everything. Car repairs should be no stress. If I want stress, I come to Bingo. Cars run in our family. Midas Car Care. The way it should be. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win one million dollars. Participating products include Old South Orange Juice, Kraft Macaroni and Cheese, Lay's Potato Chips. Now there's a million more reasons to shop at Safeway. Today's better way. Happy Canada Day. 
what better way to celebrate Canada Day with Canadian football in the opening game of the 98 season. And there's Dancing Gabe. He came up to the box. He's your new best friend now, isn't he? Sure is. He really wanted to shake hands with you, too. I was too far away. Dancing Gabe, a fixture here. Mike Pringle, a fixture in that Montreal offense. Although things have slowed down a bit, he does have his 51 yards and a couple of TDs, but Leaf, uh, they've done a pretty good job on him. Yeah, they have for the most part, but it's like anything with Pringle. You know, one mistake and he's gone, and he had the long touchdown run in the first half on the counter uh, when it picked Gamble. But uh, the one thing you always can count on with Pringle, and we've talked about it earlier, he does not tire as the game goes along. He gets stronger, so when they get into the fourth quarter, you know, that he always figures that's his quarter. Certainly has been in many games of the past. And here's Tracy Ham to throw it. Bill Coleman again. And trying for that first down marker, and he comes up shy. In fact, he's marked out of bounds at the 31. At a time last year, when the Alouettes were looking for uh, better wide receivers, they had the slot backs, but Coleman came along about midway through and impressed Dave Ritchie with his speed. Well, they had uh, and has still have Nigel Williams, a uh, young Canadian, I believe, in his third year, who's got great physical tools. You know, they always hope that the mental aspect of the game will catch up, too. But essentially, they weren't happy with him. They've got Coleman, now they got Eddie Brown. And they do have Williams as a backup if they need him. We had movement at the line, and I thought a whistle actually blew before that play got in motion. But Pringle carries the football flag on the play. Well, the Bombers are going to be called offside. for offside. Winnipeg, number 72, first down. You know, sorry, Rod. I mean, this is starting to get tough. Uh, you, you give easy first downs, and uh, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow against a good team like Montreal. Sure is. Gives them a first down, the 36-yard line. And going to work again. Some pressure on him. Still standing in the pocket. Joe Fleming almost had him, and Ham gets it away, close enough to a receiver. He was already called for grounding earlier in the game. That was close enough to Mill Coleman, incomplete. You know, one of the areas that Jeff Reinbold was concerned about was his secondary. Not that they weren't all good individual players, but they just hadn't played together at all. I mean, they were veterans other than Kwame Smith, but this group has done a great job this afternoon. Look at Tracy Ham. Not only does he have time to throw, but he just can't find anybody, and then in desperation, throws it really away to avoid the sack but this secondary hasn't made uh, any notable mistakes at all this afternoon and that's usually what happens early in the season with a new group so second and ten for Winnipeg heading down to the four minute mark of the third quarter deep for Coleman no good I jinxed them <laughs> because they made a mistake he had him wide open there, didn't he? He split the middle safety, uh, Brad Elberg. And I believe it was Kwame Smith on the outside. There you see he has split the coverage and could have had a home run. With Coleman's speed, looked like he was off to the races had he caught that ball. Oh, they, they definitely dodged one. So good break for the Bombers now as Baker stands at his 22, looking to punt it away. Winnipeg trailing by six. They led at this point 14-0, uh, I should say, at one point in the game before the Alouettes got things going. We go back to set up the return, but it is over the head of Eric Blunt. And he takes it at his 20. And out of bounds at about the 25-yard line. A punt of 55 yards. We're seeing some great punting today from Terry Baker and Bob Cameron. About Terry Baker, I mean, he had a great year last year. He ended up the season just slightly under 45 yards a punt. So, I mean, that is his strong suit, uh, punting. And Bob Cameron, I'm telling you, it's he amazing, never ceases it? to amaze me. Baker went to Mount Allison, played CIU football. Of course, with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders as a punter. Won a Grey Cup in 1989. Dave Ridgway, of course, back then was their kicker. In fact, kicked the winning field goal. But Baker does have the ring. He had some difficult years uh, with the Ottawa Rough Riders when that team was struggling before ceasing to be. And now with the Alouettes. T.J. Rubley wanted Chris Armstrong. The coverage by Irv Smith. 
and some complaints from the Bomber fans thinking it should have been interference. I think Irv Smith's timing was excellent. Uh, you know, you're going to have a look at it, but, I mean, Rubley, boy, does he put some velocity on this ball. But watch Irv Smith come from the top of your screen. The ball is coming, coming. Whoa, I don't Ooh. know. Maybe the foul. I'll stand corrected on that. Maybe the fans... Uh, Looks a little early. Sometimes the officials will rule, was the ball catchable? And, uh, yeah, I think the ball might have been catchable. I, hey, I'll take it back. I think that was interference. What surprises me is how little Armstrong argued. There's more of the fans in an uprising there. You didn't see too many bombers complaining about it. Rough recorder for Rubley and under pressure and chased out of the pocket. Fires and a complete... No, they're waving it off, saying it's no good. Spencer McLennan. You know, for a guy that they said did not have a lot of mobility, uh, T.J. Rubley has shown us that uh, he can avoid the rush as he gets outside here. The blitz is coming, and he is able to avoid it, get away from Stefan Reed, the linebacker, coming. And, you know, from our vantage point, we just couldn't tell whether McLennan trapped it or not, but obviously he did. So third down for Winnipeg. Cameron back deep again to kick it away, but has enjoyed a very good day. He's had a couple of kicks in excess of 50 yards. And that's another pretty good spiral hanging high and right settling under it at his 40. Nearly a block from behind and right is sprung loose. Chris Wright, lots of room. Cameron the only one back and he goes out of bounds at the 26-yard line. Special teams rears its head again. And the boos coming down from the Winnipeg fans who thought there should have been an illegal block, a flip way back at the 40-yard line. Well, it was Don Robinson, number 29, that has the shot, and that's what the fans are complaining about. He's got the contain to the left of your screen, and, you know, if you're going to be the contained guy, you got to stay out. Now, that was right there, just if you, if you saw it to the right of your screen. And Wright has that speed to get outside. The second leading punt returner in the CFL last year next to Mike Pinball Clemens of the Argonauts. A great return. They set up Montreal in business again at the 25-yard line. The Alouettes lead by six, and they're in position to add to their lead now. They set up screen to Mike Souls, and Greg Battle buries him right at the line of scrimmage. Well, Battle read that perfectly, and you know he's only seen these about a thousand times in his career. And you know, his soul sneaks out. Battle reads it, still has the acceleration to get out there, and the ball took a long time to get there, didn't sure it? Sure did. That's got to be painful for the guy on the receiving end. That it happened is, to you much? It is not a lot of fun, and yes, it did. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Eddie Brown, the intended receiver. Well, I think after that big punt return by Chris Wright, if all that Winnipeg gives up is three points, they should be pretty happy. Terry Baker's had a couple of long field goals in this game, including one from 51, another one from about 45 yards away. A little frustration, I think, I sense with Tracy Ham. He hasn't had one of his patented certainly not a great passing day for him well it, it, it's like they've never really established anything it's it, it's like they haven't really established their passing game they haven't really established the running game they're kind of just caught in between right now of what what they want to do and they're just not doing anything really well Baker is three for three that one about 32 yards away and it increases the Alouette lead to 23 to 14 they were down by 14 but 23 unanswered points and well, they have the nine-point lead now. And, and they've done it in a, not a very flashy fashion, have they? I no. mean, it just seems like, you know, they've fought it away and almost in very unworkmanlike fashion. But all of a sudden, 23 points later, Jeff Reinbold's team is in a hole. And, I mean, this is not a, a great come-from-behind offense right now. No, and you pointed it out. Something Reinbold must be a little frustrated with, those penalties that kept Montreal drops alive, they have been very costly. Well, it costs you plays during a game. I mean, you're only going to get so many, but, you know, they've had at least three times that they've given Montreal first down. That's six plays right away, automatic, and uh, add on a few first downs. That's six, at least six plays that his offense could have had the ball for and didn't.
I'm sure Reinbold would be the first to admit there's more pressure on him this year than last year. Well, he inherited a team last year and had to try and rebuild it. But all the changes that, you know, we've documented 15 out of 24 starters are new, but they're his decisions now. So right. He's going to have to justify what he has done. Derek Blunt again at his 20 on the kickoff. Good yardage right up the middle over the 40-yard line to about the 43. And this is one of the big decisions for Jeff Reinbold was bringing in a quarterback to replace Chris Vargas and Kevin McDougal. Vargas still here as a backup, but this is the man, T.J. Rubley, yeah. signed him to a three-year contract. Tough third quarter. Uh, I think what they have to do right now is to reevaluate what did we do well in the first half. And on first down, they threw swing passes to Eric Plunt that were very effective. They went to the short passing game outside of Larry Thompson. I think they've got to look back and reflect on what did we do well and maybe try to get back to that now. He throws again. Over the middle, what a nice catch. Spencer McLennan to the Montreal 45. Walt Spencer's a guy you, you have to love to the left of your screen here. He's been a defensive back, a slot back, all over the place, done everything he's always been asked to do, and now he's asked to stretch out in a vulnerable position and make that catch, knowing the hit from a tough hitter in Tom Europe is coming. He makes the catch, and, you know, you look at little plays. That's a big one. And here's another one. Sean Millington did this a time or two in B.C., straight up the gut, and about a 10-yard gain close to... If not, another bomber first down. And you see what that catch did for this Winnipeg team. You feel the crowd now is back into the game. And now the offensive line comes off. Millington's running harder. They create a good hole for him and almost get a first down. But that one catch, that one little play, has now brought new life back into the bombers when they were pretty flat. They do look a little more fired up now. As it's second and very short. Call it inches. Rubley's kept in this situation before, and he does again. And I'd be curious to know what Lee Pedersen's marks are on that keeper. Again, I, I'm not overly impressed. <laughs> but he does get the first down right at quarter time. As the Alouettes have increased their lead here in the second half on the strength of another field goal. But Winnipeg is on the move to start the fourth quarter. They've got momentum, and they're down by nine. They need some points. Let's head back to CFL Live Control and James Duffy. You're watching CFL Live, and we're at the quarter. Here's your host, James Duffy. All right, welcome back to CFL Control. We've been focusing on T.J. Rubley throughout this ball game. He looked very sharp in the first half, but the Owls did get to him a little bit, especially at the start of that third quarter. Here are his stats. As you see, 9 for 17 in the first half, only 3 for 9 in the third quarter, and the most important stat, that one interception, although it wasn't necessarily his fault. Looks like his arm may have been hit here as he was about to release it, but nevertheless, there's the pick. Tracy Gravely is off to the races, and just two plays later, Mike Pringle would go in, and that gives the Owls the lead. Now, that last drive, he's looking okay again. He doesn't seem phased at all. Right, well, the two things I like about him, about T.J. Rubley, in a physical standpoint, number one is how well he throws the football. I mean, he's a classic quarterback in stance, the trajectory and the uh, velocity on the football. He's going to complete some passes, and I really think that they have found a quarterback in T.J. Rubley for the entire season, but this is a critical time because this is where the good quarterbacks take over the game. A Danny McManus, for instance, will take this game over and complete the passes, just like what Rubley did to Spencer McClanahan. That was a classic quarterback to a slot back scene pattern that's what he's got to do this is important quarterback for him or important quarter for him to take it to another level make it happen when he has to Eric well Chris we're talking about Winnipeg and certainly TJ Rubley is the story today but the significant thing in the first half I mean in this in the second half is the fact that Montreal while it wasn't pretty they took over the ball game and they have a nine point lead at this point I think they went back and simplified their offense went back to just establishing the run and they have to feel good at this point James all right Montreal has outscored the Bombers 23 nothing in the last quarter and a half here and they've taken the lead 23 14 to score let's head back now for the fourth quarter here is Rod Smith and Leif Pedersen in Winnipeg 
thank you, gentlemen. It's uh, Winnipeg fans that get the first live look at the CFL, but CFL Live continues all week. In fact, Leaf and I hop on a plane, head out to BC Place to watch David Archer's first game back after being up in the booth with you. And uh, see, he mastered, last year. he mastered broadcasting, so he said, oh, heck, I've done that now. I might as well go back and play quarterback. Again. When's your comeback? <laughs> Never. Talk about that in a second as we look at Eric Blunt taking the swing pass. And the Bombers, who have been on the move in this last drive, picking up more yardage there, getting close to another first down. Yeah, this is a good-looking drive. And, and, and back, you know, Eric Tillman talked about back to basics for the Alouettes. Well, well, this is back to basics again, too. They had success, I suggested, in the first half with the swing pass on first down. Again, a great call on first down. Give it to a guy who catches the ball well and runs even better. I mean, that's the kind of guy you want to get the ball in his hands in a hurry. Another second and short yardage. This time he hands off. It's blunt again. First down and a little bit more down close to the Alouette 20-yard line. The Bombers are indeed on the move. Down by nine. And with the fourth quarter beginning, pretty vital that they pick up something, at least a field goal here, to keep it close. Well, I think, you know, for a, for a young team, when they get, you know, you only get so many chances against a good defense like Montreal. And, and now that you're... You know, getting close to inside the 20-yard line, you, you've got to be thinking touchdown. See Ted Long back in this fourth quarter after being injured earlier. Flanking out wide right. And quick pass inside. Goes to Matt DeBuck. Takes it down at the 16-yard line. Another completion for Rubley. Yeah, that's a good call, too. Spread, spread the defense out. You're going to have some natural seams that are created by your own your formation and then all Matt DeBuck has to do is to get inside position which he did easy ball to complete I mean they, they get only about four and a half yards but nevertheless another positive play in this drive it's second down Rubley end zone but nobody there he wanted Chris Armstrong good coverage on the play and some complaints again about that coverage, but to no avail. It'll be third down. Well, Harold Nash, uh, double zero, he, he's a tough one-on-one -on -one cover guy. And Chris Armstrong's just trying to get to the inside on him. And, you know, for Nash, he's allowed to establish his position, too. And he established it early, and there he is. And, you know, the ball, that's the kind of ball that almost needs to be thrown more on the line. But he couldn't do it because Europe, the safety was coming across. And, you know, that play just had no chance to succeed. So they'll see if they can get three. Troy Westwood. This will be spotted about the 24. Hopping in. No problem as they cut the lead to six again. On the field goal by Westwood. The Bombers at three. 23-17 now in the fourth quarter. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win $1 million. If your name appears, it means you have won VTEX 900 megahertz digital cordless telephone with visual name and number call waiting caller ID. Featuring 50 caller ID memory, 20 number speed dial storage, and backlit keypad. Or a Samsung Hi8 Hi-Fi stereo camcorder with color viewfinder. 12 times optical power zoom, built-in lens cover, and remote control. Simply treasured for now and for always. Simply Samsung. Enter your ballot at your local Safeway food and drug today. We drained the oil from this car and added just this much Castrol Syntec. We then ran it over 160 kilometers per hour and waited and waited and waited. You see, Syntec has a unique molecular structure that bonds to engine parts, protecting them under the most torturous conditions. And if a little Syntec protects this well, imagine what a full oil change can do. Castrol Syntec Full Synthetic protects in ways other oils can. For 50 years, Honda has led the way from the Isle of Man to Daytona. Right now, you can experience what it's all about. Take a demo ride today, and you'll know why Honda leads the world. You owe yourself this one, the chance of a lifetime. The Honda 50th Anniversary Sale. Your best chance to own a Honda in a half century. Rod Smith and Lee Pedersen back at Winnipeg Stadium. And good way to start things off here on Canada Day and the launch of the 98 CFL season. It has been a close game. The Alouettes were clear favorites. They were down for a while. 
And now it's Winnipeg trying to come back. They've cut the lead to six. After the field goal by Troy Westwood, who will kick things off here. An interesting style as they break things up and then head down the field. Yeah, the 20-yard line is Chris Wright, and he is met nicely. By number 25, Sean Millington. Good special teams play. He probably hasn't been on a whole lot of kick cover teams, but he makes the most of it here and uh, gets through the block. And this is a good hit. I like that. You know, you get to be the hammer instead of the nail. You know, on offense, we used to say, well, we we're always the nails getting hammered. But for Millington, that's probably fun playing on this team. Well, his head coach now, Jeff Reinbold, used to be a special teams guy. What do you thought with the kind of strength that he has coming down the field? He's buried a few defensive players, and there he gets a chance to bury Chris Wright on the return. First down, Alouette. Springle has it, and like many times today, they have them all tied up. He's had some gains, and you know he'll get more, but for the most part, they've done a pretty good job locking him up. And again, Winnipeg makes the adjustment where they bring Maurice Kelly from the safety to linebacker and keep Elberg in, and watch how he fights through here, and he's going to run Pringle down from behind. He's coming kind of on a half blitz here. When he sees the play develop, he sneaks in behind the pulling guard, Okiki, and that's a great first down defensive play to set yourself up in a good situation, second and 12. Kelly, one of the many former players of Jeff Reinbold, and they were in D.C. together and even in Las Vegas, back with him again. Oh, in and out of the hands of Eddie Brown at midfield. And a good pop from Brandon Hamilton to make sure he didn't hang on to it. You know what? I talked about this matchup early in the game where they put Hamilton on Eddie Brown and Kwame Smith on Mill Coleman. This has been a good matchup. I mean, we have not talked about Coleman and Brown a whole lot today. So these two corners have taken these receivers essentially out of the game. And it's because of the hit right there. He strips right through the football. That's what you're taught. Fight through the ball. And Brandon Hamilton did a super job. And talk about a good defensive series for Winnipeg. Here's another ex-Lion that Reinbold knew well and came over last year, his second year in Winnipeg. Another long punt there by Terry Baker, and Ted Long has nowhere to go but out. But the 32-33 yard line where Winnipeg will start after a 50-yard punt by Baker. There are a lot of ex-Lions and Las Vegas posse players with Reinbold now. <laughs> I mean, you could run down the list now. That even the guys he got with you Maurice surprised? Kelly and Joe Kelly. Sorry, Joe Fleming, but uh, I guess not. A coach gets used to certain guys. They become free agents. Jeff Reinbold knows them, knows what their strengths are. Yeah, and I don't think there's any question. I mean, uh, Jeff has a, a lot of players around the league have some strong allegiances to Jeff Reinbold. I mean, he's a good guy to play for. So when the opportunity presents itself, I'm sure uh, there's a lot of guys who love to come and play for him. Throw it up to the side to Chris Armstrong. He has it. And a first down and more. Tiptoeing up the sideline. The sticks moving again for Winnipeg. And when you... Well, when you run a screen like this to your slot back Armstrong, the key is to get the block at the point of attack. And to his credit, Larry Thompson got the key blocked, and that sprung Armstrong loose for the first down. Hand off this time to Millington. Stuffed up fairly well for a gain of about two yards. And Stefan Reed, the linebacker for the Alouettes, has him all locked up. And Stefan Reed has really been willing to stick his nose up into the middle. He kind of switches with Larry McSeed on who plays in the middle on certain defensive alignments, but he has really been able to stick his face in there on a couple of occasions this afternoon. From Merritt, B.C., in his fourth year. From the CFL, Rumley throwing again. Nash has the coverage. And Armstrong, it appeared to be him or Larry Thompson, the intended receiver. Fans don't like it again, but it seemed to be a bit of a mix-up there. I think there was a mix-up with Chris Armstrong. I think Rumley was hoping that he would kind of take his pattern off to the corner and he has to throw it there's Armstrong right here and and, and you know where the ball is coming out here so you ex he's expecting the receiver to get out there but Armstrong really does Armstrong has not looked comfortable the entire day he's made some catches but he just hasn't looked in sync with this offense and where he's supposed to be and where the quarterback thinks he's supposed to be 
So Winnipeg and Bob Cameron punting again. Coming down to about 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. They're down by six. Another nice punt. Chasing right back to his 15. Stays on his feet. Good balance. Up to about the 25-yard line. A 47-yard punt. Another good one for Cameron. Alouettes have the football and a six-point lead. And now, another TSN sports break. We're back live at the TSN newsroom. Surprising signing by the Toronto Blue Jays today. 39-year-old Tony Phillips has uh, signed a minor league contract. Meanwhile, on the field, the Jays were taking on the Mets at Skydome this afternoon. Toronto wearing their annual Canada Day uniforms, trailing 8-7 in the eighth until Alex Gonzalez gets one. Gal Gonzalez rips it to left, a three-run shot, gives Toronto a 10-7 lead, and then they really start to pour it on. Still in the eighth inning, bases loaded, third baseman Ed Sprague at the plate. He unloads him with a double to left center. All three runs come to score as the Jays win his slugfest this afternoon 15 to 10 over the Mets six straight home win don't forget we have Canada's other team on the network for Canada Day as the Expos take on the Red Sox in Boston Dustin Hermanson goes up against Brett Saberhagen 7 Eastern 4 Pacific more football coming up stay with us I don't take requests I don't do encores and no it's not over when the fat lady sings it's baseball folks and that's the ball game Mets versus Jays, TSN Thursday. TSN leads the way, all the way, to the world's most coveted trophy. Four years in the making, the final goal, the World Cup. Catch France 98 on TSN, the soccer network. We have baseball on TSN tonight. Expos baseball. Baseball tonight. The uh, Expos and Boston Red Sox's interleague play continues from Fenway Park, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific. Dave Van Horn and Gary Carter. Good turnout in Winnipeg today to watch a, a pretty good football game. Tracy Ham and the Owls have the lead. And they start at their 26. And they hand off. And it gets up over the 30-yard uh, line with big Michael Souls rumbling there. Greg Battle in on the tackle. Battle is also a coach with this team. In fact, he started the season as a coach only. Wanted to know if he could just get that feeling back and whether he was, he was going to play again. I guess Jeff Reinbold was just waiting for him. He likes getting the paycheck back, I think, too. That has something to do with it. It always has a little bit of the motivating factor is that paycheck. Fortunately, Greg Battle, uh, the injured player there, Michael Souls, really was some power. He took Souls head on, and uh, he did not win that one. Well, if ever there's a guy in this league that has earned a paycheck or two, it's certainly Greg Battle. And remember the outstanding seasons that he had with the Bombers, especially back in the early 90s. I think back to that year in 1990 when they won the Grey Cup, and he was one of the anchors of that D, and I think he was a uh, defensive player of that game. In 1990, he was a defensive MVP, two times league defensive MVP. So in his 13 years, I mean, there have certainly uh, been a, a tremendous amount of awards that have come his way. Here is Greg Battle right here, and as Souls comes up, he makes the tackle there, but it just appears as though his teammates and a few others roll over on him. And you watch his legs. Here comes Neil Fort, 66. That's only about 370 uh, pounds rolling on you there, too. That so, load will hurt. Yeah, it, it sure will. Slow to get up. And not getting up at all, actually. Let's see. Battle in his 12th season, and most of the years, see him grimacing in pain, most of those years spent with Winnipeg. He left for a while to join Las Vegas Posse when they came into the league, and then he wound up late that year going to the Ottawa Rough Riders. And also time in uh, Saskatchewan as well. So he does get off the field, but not looking all that comfortable right now. And it's about a second and five for Montreal. Ham throws, wanted souls. They say no catch. And Brad Elberg among the crowd applauding that call by the official. I don't know. Souls really felt like he made the catch on that one. Uh, you know, we, we don't, we have a good look 
here uh, not so good from our vantage point and and I don't know Ooh. I looked like the ball did touch the ground and he did a nice job of cradling it and trying to fool the officials but the officials made a good call Elberg as we talked about before was a running back in college he tried the NFL and now maybe he's found a home as a defensive player well, he's had a lot of playing time today uh, you know battle gets hurt and goes out Kelly moves up to linebacker Elberg comes in so you know they are counting on him the punt from Baker unusually short for the way he's been punting today and it takes a Winnipeg roll and back out across the 45 yard line only 33 yards on that kick as T.J. Rubley talks things over with his offensive coordinator, Joe Pow Pow. And uh, what a perfect coordinator to have for a young quarterback. I mean, Joe Pow Pow had so much success as a player, but what I like about Joe is he's not very excitable. He's got a very soft manner. It's, uh, it's just the way he is. And he's got a great football mind, and he's a good teacher. So he has a lot of skills to impart on a T.J. Rubley. Rubley goes to work. Play action fake. He's running around. And he wants, but he doesn't get the completion to Eric Blunt. He would have been down around the 45-yard line of Montreal. A little bit too much on it that time. That's a tough pass to try and complete. You've got to just feather it in perfectly, and uh, he, he just wasn't able to do it. Blunt had a step on McSeed. T.J. Rubley, clock ticking down towards the eight-minute mark. Not much time to go in the second and ten. Pressure's on. Almost gets away from it, but doesn't. They have him in the sack, and it's Doug Peterson. Well, Rubley really had no chance today, and although the Alouettes haven't had a lot of sacks, they've had some pretty good pressure, and again, it's Doug Peterson, uh, left of your screen, coming right in there, beats the block, and Rubley really has no shot to get away from the pass rush. You know, we haven't mentioned Alfred Payton hardly at all today, so that's a credit to Chris Perez and Craig Hendrickson, the two tackles of Winnipeg, but, uh, boy, I could... Payton one time had a good move where he had an inside move and, and got uh, the sack, but other than that, uh, kind of non-existent. That not a, that he's not working hard. Oh, no, I'm sure. He, he was the sack leader last year, though, and you really notice him with the sacks, and you're right. Hasn't been that kind of presence today. Another good punt by Cameron. Right, it is 25, trying to get outside. He cuts back in and gets about six more yards. No scrimmage from the 31 after a 43-yard punt. The Alouettes, about 7.34 to go here in Winnipeg. They lead it 23-17. Ah, open wide. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, you're doing something right. Uh -huh. Less plaque and tartar. Uh -huh. Gums are looking very nice. You are doing something right. Uh -huh. Have I told you about Colgate Total? Uh -huh. It's the only one that works between brushings. Uh -huh. The only toothpaste that goes beyond fighting cavities to provide long-lasting protection against all these problems. Colgate Total, the choice of today's dentists. So, I should keep using Colgate Total. Pardon? Hi, me again with my bits and bites. Sticking my hand in the bag and coming out with a different handful. Well, what do we got here? Three cheese bits, four spiced rings, and two pretzel sticks. Delicious. Next handful, whole new ball game. You can't get bored eating bits and bites snacks because your mouth never knows till it's all over. Bits and bites by Christy. Every handful is different. Yeah. the lineup. It's called Big Time Sports all summer long on TSN. The Alouettes leading the Bombers in Winnipeg by six. Let's get an update from the Bombers sideline. Here's Greg Musselman. Okay, thanks, Ron. I was just over by the Bombers bench here, and Greg Bout is in a lot of pain at this moment. 
Uh, they're rubbing around the abdominal area just beside his belly button. Glenn Scrivener, one of his teammates on the uh, defensive line, said that it was cramps, but it looks a lot more serious than that. A lot of people over there working on battle. Of course, the veteran, he is uh, a guy that does the long snapping, so they'll miss him in that area and his experience on the field as well, but I doubt that he'll get back in. Back up to you guys. Okay, thank you, Greg. So concerns with the Bomber D on the field right now after a first down catch by Matt Cody over the 40-yard line. Battle has historically fought the cramps in all of his 13 seasons. He, he, for some reason, it's just his body, his metabolism on a hot day like this. And I'm not suggesting that's what the problem is, but if it is cramps, he, year in and year out, has always had problems with them. And it is a hot day here in Winnipeg. It was deceiving from where we sit now, going down on the field. It is scorching. They say about 26, 27. It feels like it's over 30 down at that field level. You know, I, I flew back after a Labor Day game with Winnipeg at Saskatchewan some years ago, and we flew from Saskatchewan to Winnipeg and then on to Toronto, but on that flight, the Bombers were with us, and he, Greg Battle, had the cramps so bad in his legs that he was up in first class. They had him in two seats, all his legs all packed in ice. He was in his underwear, and that's how bad he was, and, and he was, I mean, totally drained of all fluids, so he really has battled that problem throughout his career. It keeps them out of the rest of this game by the looks of things as Tracy Han got the short yardage in the run by Pringle before and second and long finds Mac Cody again. Cody's getting a little busier in the second half and has another first down for the Alouettes across midfield. Well, I don't think the Alouettes haven't had a little chat amongst themselves. You know, we're just under six minutes to go in the fourth quarter. They have a nice six-point lead, and they've said, look, if we're going to be a championship team, here's where we have to show it right now in the opening game of the season. I'll guarantee you they talked about that on the sidelines. And now a couple of catches by Matt Cody, a run by Mike Pringle. And, you know, you've got yourself a couple of first downs. And this is where you separate the men from the boys uh, and show you that you're a great team that everybody thinks you are. His third catch, and remember it was his first one that set up another Mike Pringle touchdown. He got it down near the end zone. Now here is Pringle again. And picking up about five yards on that play across the 50-yard line. We expected a good crowd here at Winnipeg Stadium, and we certainly got one on a beautiful 1st of July Canada Day. Over 22,000 fans here. Yeah, I think that's a good crowd. There was a lot of events going on in the city of Winnipeg today competing for the entertainment dollars. So I think the Blue Bombers, uh, on, on what for the fans is kind of a look-see right now, I think 22 is pretty good. And as far as the season ticket holders, and that number certainly improved in the offseason, one of the carrots is, of course, a chance for Grey Cup tickets here this November. The pass for Cody that time as Ham takes a hit, falls incomplete. And reason for the fans to continue to stay, because they're within a converted touchdown of the lead, trailing by six points. Well, they're going to get a few opportunities probably uh, left. Jeff Reinbold knows that, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very simple. Uh, there's no great secrets at this stage. You've got to execute, uh, move the ball, and you trail by six. I don't know that a couple of field goals are going to get it done to tie it. I think they have to be thinking touchdown to win. The punt from Baker. Another good one. High spiral. My goodness, the punting's been good today. That is deep. And that'll just fall for a single point. Ted Long lets it roll out. Or be thinking touchdown to tie. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Wait that, for that point. That's a big single. It sure is. Two field goals or a touchdown. Don't worry about the convert. You could have a tie game there. So. Or excuse me. Yeah, the seven-point lead within a touchdown to tie. So it is very huge for the Alouettes. You look at Rubley again. Trying to get these guys psyched up again for another drive. They do need that touchdown. And they got them early in this game. A short plunge by Sean Millington. And got a longer one as well to Larry Thompson. To take the 14-0 lead. But they've had only three points to show for their efforts since then. Bobbling the shotgun snap. Ridley gets it out to Chris Armstrong. Breaks the tackle. And then is forced out of bounds close to the Winnipeg 40-yard line. Wow, when you bobble a snap, the timing on that play has to be so crucial. You get it to your receiver as quickly as you can because it's tough.
for the other receivers to hold their blocks for a long period of time. They're not used to doing that. And when you bobble it, you really put yourself in a hole. And although Armstrong had a good run after the catch, he still only picked up a few yards. Second down. Ruby to throw again. More pressure loses the ball. And the Alouettes have it. It's Steve Charbonneau, the defensive tackle, who comes up with it. And another big break for Montreal. And I think it was Steve Charbonneau on the rush, the young defensive tackle that uh, comes up with a play. T.J. Rubley really had no chance. He was just swarmed. And the initial pressure coming up the middle, it is Steve Charbonneau. He knocks the ball loose. And, you know, they try to pick it up, Swift Birch and that. But in the end, it's Charbonneau with the sack, Charbonneau with the fumble recovery. And uh, the way it should be, right? Well, if you do all that work, you may as well get the ball as well. I think you're right. 3.37 to go, and Montreal ahead by seven. Tom Hips had been the incumbent in that position, but injuries to him left an opening there, even though Hips, I believe, is fine now for Charbonneau to take the spot. Yeah, Tom Hips is back on the roster. He had a shoulder injury in training camp and really didn't play in the preseason at all, and uh, Steve Charbonneau really worked on his game. I mean, that's the coach's dream is to have that kind of depth. And Cowansville Quebec who played his college ball in New Hampshire. So they give it off to Michael Souls for a short game. But heading down near, near that Winnipeg 20-yard line, and with the seven-point lead, and only down to about three minutes to go in this game, it's going to be awfully tough for Winnipeg. The Alouettes rack up some more points in this drive. And they do issue the three-minute warning. We'll take a break, and we'll be back with that one. Winnipeg Stadium, right after this. At your steel dealer, you'll find a complete line of chainsaws sold and serviced by professionals who really know their business. And right now, steel German engineered chainsaws are sale priced from just $299.95. Steel, built to last, priced to sell. 400 of the world's best alternative sport athletes are taking it to the extreme in San Diego. Day two of the 1998 Summer X Games, an extreme experience on TSN. Mike Weir, Esquire. Lisa Van Exen, Esquire. Meet the Esquire collection. Michael Bonaccini, Esquire. Thomas Klein, Esquire. A line of fashionable Swiss watches designed for Canadians who like to play as hard as they work. Shelley Wilner, Esquire. Todd Vins, Esquire. Jasmine Selak, Esquire. The Contessa, elegant textured dial and sculptured bezel set with sparkling white stones. Esquire watch, it has your name on it. Deborah Burstein, Esquire. The Alouette season opener, home opener. This is their season opener against Saskatchewan July the 9th. They get tickets, 514-254-1818. And in my opinion, Leaf, where they're playing now, Molson Stadium is a better place to watch a football game than the Big O, especially when the crowds are around 18 to 20, and they're open for that. Well, it's certainly a more intimate venue, and uh, it's what the people of Montreal have asked for, asked for, so they've given it to them. From what I understand, uh, you better get your tickets because it could be a sellout. So, that'd be great to see, and maybe we owe it all to the Rock Group, you too, because their day at Olympic right. Stadium forced Montreal to make other plans. The playoff game against BC last year turned out to be great atmosphere, and they got their best crowd of the season. Pam, the Alouette's on the move again, and then that one falls incomplete to set up a field goal situation for Terry Baker. And with a seven-point lead, looking to make it ten, it will be awfully tough under three minutes to go now in this game, quite possibly, for Winnipeg. You talked about hurry up before. They get the field goal here. That hurry up offense is going to have to be on in earnest for Rubley. Well, I think if Terry Baker makes this, uh, I think Winnipeg's chances of getting two scores in two minutes and 50-odd seconds, uh, I mean, that's asking a lot from a young quarterback. Looks like he's going to face that challenge, though, because it's up and in from 28 yards away. And the Alouettes indeed have the 10-point lead now, 27 to 17. Terry Baker is four for four. Uh, he, that one wasn't that pretty. He's kind of smiling and laughing. He, he didn't exactly hit that ball flush. 
But uh, the good news for Montreal fans is that it did go through, and now T.J. Rubley needs uh, at least two scores to try and tie this game. So the young quarterback, albeit at age 29, he's, of course, played his pro ball with the NFL and the World League of American Football, now NFL Europe, but a rookie in the CFL, not a bad debut at all. Well, the one interception was a deflected ball that I would not uh, consider his fault at all. And, you know, the, the key thing, the numbers are good. The numbers aren't bad. It's just that, you know, at, at crucial times in the game, you've got to be able to move your club. And we'll see if he can do it. He is challenged now, down by 10 and completes. Oh. The first pass of the drive to Larry Thompson up near the 50. But you got to go out of bounds. I mean, there's 2.47 to go, and, and the clock is going to start now as soon as they move the chains. I mean, that is a play where a veteran receiver, Larry Thompson, you've got to go out of bounds. So they, they do hurry up and set up at the 49 of the Blue Bombers. And they don't lose a lot of time, but... Under pressure, Peterson had him again, and he is taken down, and Alfred Payton is standing over them as well. See, high fives with Peterson. Well, Doug Peterson uh, has been the dominant force on the uh, defensive line for the Alouettes today, and we talked about him moving off the nose where he can't be double teamed as much, and that has really paid dividends for him personally today because he's had a couple of sacks, he's had some good pressure, and... You know, it's a lot easier going one and one than having to battle the center and another guard all the time. Loss of close to six yards on the play. So a bigger hole to dig out of for Rubley. Makes it up right there. Chris Armstrong over the middle. First down Winnipeg at the Montreal 45. Uh, it's a good throw. He sees the coverage. There's lots of room to get it into Armstrong. And what I like is he steps up and puts it in the hole, lets his receiver go and get it. And... As soon as that catch was made, to Rupley's credit, he was getting everybody up on the line of scrimmage, and he's not wasting any time. He'll be passing again just about every play. Some confusion there as Harold Nash pushes off Larry Thompson and nearly has an interception. Well, here's uh, Larry Thompson right here, and Nash, watch the physical confrontation. At some point, you got to get off the jam, and... You know, Larry Thompson just doesn't. Is this holding? Uh, I, you know, I think Thompson's got a legitimate beef. You can't keep your hands on a guy that long. You can get the jam, but I think Nash got away with one. 2.16 on the scoreboard clock. And another pass for Rubley. Rolling to his right under pressure again. He gets it away. Nearly picked off by Irv Smith with flags in the play. And this could be going against Montreal. Spencer McLennan was knocked down in the middle of the field. The flag came, and so uh, Winnipeg is going to get a break, and they've got to collect themselves and uh, get ready for the next play. They know they're going to get the penalty in a first down. Illegal contact on an eligible receiver. Montreal number seven. First down. Called on Tracy Gravely, and a big penalty it is as the sticks move. And a first down for Winnipeg at the Montreal 35. They're down by 10. Just over two minutes on the clock. They need in the end zone. Or at the very least a field goal. They need two scores. The pass is no good. And it could have even been worse as an Alouette defender is right there, Torrey Hunter. Well, they've run that play with uh, some success, but the key is that Larry Thompson has to get the key block for his buddy Chris Armstrong. And Larry Thompson is kind of out of gas right now, and he, he just didn't even make an effort at all at Torrey Hunter, and Hunter had a better chance to catch that ball. You know, here's where you look at teams, and it's a hot day. You know, who, who can keep it going in the fourth quarter? And, you know, Larry Thompson looks like he's a little bit on empty. They throw it off to Millington. He's got some room. Picking up speed. Tries to stay on his feet, but he does it get across the 20-yard line. And the Bomber is on the move again. Another first down. They are threatening. That's a good call by Rubley. That play has worked for them all day, whether it's Eric Blonde or Sean Millington. And Millington in the open field is a load. I mean, Larry McSee just ran right by him. Millington, tremendous agility for a big man. And... You know, give Rubley credit. He looks like he's in total control here and everything under command. 
Rubley looks to the end zone for Armstrong. Flags on the play. This will go against the Alouettes. I don't know. Armstrong pushed off. There was a lot of contact. The touchdown, Montreal. Winnipeg, I should say. And with the convert, the Bombers can close to within three points. Well, that was a heck of a play by Chris Armstrong. We'll see it on a replay after the convert, but... You know, he gained that separation. There was a lot of contact, but the official said it was Nash creating it. But to Armstrong's credit, he created the separation. Convert's good. A three-point game now. The Bombers are making this close. And another look at it later. Well, to the right of your screen, you probably won't see the contact, but what you'll see is the separation there right at the very end. And Chris Armstrong did a good job to, to slow his body down, initiate contact, and, I mean, you be the judge. That's kind of those flip a coin ones, but the referees chose to, to look at it favorably for Armstrong and Rubley with a heck of a drive. Now, brought the situation with a minute and 50 to go. You're three points behind. You go all or nothing on the short onside kick or with a minute and 50. I mean, you know, you, you don't lose a lot of time if you stop Montreal on two plays. Of course, the way the Alouettes run the football, I guess the risk is if they can run the ball and eat up a lot of the clock. Well, and again, you know, Montreal anticipating the onside kick. Montreal anticipating if they have put out a team on the field and you're going to see, you're going to see 10 or 11 players from Montreal right up in there. And those, those actually 11 players are used to handling the football. They're expecting a short kick, so they, they've adjusted accordingly, too. I don't know. This is a tough call for a coach to kick it away with a minute and 50 or try it all or nothing. At many points in this game, the Bomber defense has answered the call. And they are being asked to answer it again because they do kick it deep. And it's Mike Pringle on the return. Not Chris Wright and Pringle taking it up to the 40-yard line. I really fault Troy Westwood on that play. They got 11 men up and only Pringle back, and yet Westwood kicked it on a line drive to Pringle, and Pringle didn't even need any blocking to go at least 15 or 20 yards. If you're going to do that as a kicker, you got to kick it on a line somewhere where that one guy isn't. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a mental mistake on the, on the kicker's part because they're now at the 40-yard line. A good situation for Montreal to start with with 1.44 on the clock. Trying to get the crowd into it. Pam will take off himself. He hasn't called his own number very much today, but he gets close to a first down for the Alouettes, a gain of eight or nine. And David Maeva on the stop. Boy, how many times throughout his career when the game's on the line have you seen Tracy Ham do that? He hasn't run the ball at all today. But Actually, when, I think that was his first run, wasn't it? Well, he, five carries, but those are probably the short yardage, short ones. yardage ones. But first time he's actually taken off. When he saw the opportunity, you know, when the game's on the line, he does it. Guys like Damon Allen will do it. That's how you win ball games. Big, big play here. Pringle has a first down. 116 on the clock. And the Alouettes still have the football and will keep the ball. Well, this is when you roll the dice to kick it or to try the onside kick. You know, now the Winnipeg's worst nightmares are coming through. They've had a first down. You've got a 20-second clock back in. That's maybe 38 seconds that you can run in two plays now. At some point, Winnipeg's going to probably have to try and call a timeout. In their second game of the season last year, after losing to the Argonauts, Winnipeg came home and lost to Montreal by a score of 27 and 24. That's the score now as Pringle adds some more yardage to his total across midfield into Blue Bomber territory. Yeah, 
And Leaf, you alluded to it before, at any time of the game, particularly late, Mike Pringle can kill you. Well, I mean, that last run was as hard as he ran in the first quarter, so. The Alouettes were the favorites heading in. The Bombers gave them a huge battle. They had a 14-point lead at one point. But they're down by three, and on the option. Pringle takes it, and he has more. Could be gone again. They catch him down inside the five-yard line. Pringle gets stronger. Yeah, Tracy Ham just held that ball to the last possible second on the option, and, you know, you talk about execution. When the game is on the line, the Montreal Alouettes executed, and uh, the fans are exiting in a hurry here. But, you know, they commit... Wesley Lisi on the outside commits, and uh, nobody's really there to make the play on Pringle. And nearly had his third touchdown of the game. Did you see Brandon Hamilton wrap him up inside the five? Let me just say this, that I don't disagree at all with the call that Jeff Reinbold and his staff made to kick off in that situation and try and stop them. I don't disagree with that one bit. In fact, I think that's the play I'd have made, too. But you would have liked to seen a better kick. I would have liked to seen a lot better kick, and maybe that, you know, in hindsight, that wasn't the difference. But starting at the 40-yard line when you've only got one guy back as opposed to maybe the 25 is a bit of a different mental psyche for the, both teams. Well, I give the Bombers a lot of credit here given the number of changes that they've had in this game. 24 seconds left in the clock, and it doesn't look like they're going to win it. Well, uh, unfortunately, they, they're going to come awfully close and maybe a, a bitter pill to swallow, but, you know, I know Jeff Reinbold is a very upbeat, positive guy. So is Joe Pow Pow and uh, Harry Justvig and all the James Murphy, all the other coaches, and they're going to just have to take this for what it is, a learning experience today, and try to build on it, and uh, I, I'm sure they will. Jeff Reinbold didn't know exactly what to expect from this team with all the changes. He just wants them to continue to grow and to improve. And I'm sure there are some things about this game that he will take from it as being positive. Well, he's got to be happy with the hurry-up offense that T.J. Rubley ran to get the touchdown to Armstrong. I mean, th that was great. And they have no reason to seek out the end zone again as they down it. That's a pretty classy move on Dave Ritchie's part. I mean, you know, players like statistics and like touchdowns, but hey, that's a pretty classy move on Dave Ritchie's part to just say, look, we've got the game one, no need to shove it down anybody's throat, and uh, I must say I really respect him for what he's doing right now. And that's the last play of the game. The Alouettes start the season in the win column, taking it by three. Play Safeway's Million Dollar Touchdown to win for your chance to win $1 million. If your name appears, it means you have won the Minolta Dimash Brick Digital Steel Camera with built-in flash, 1.8-inch color LCD monitor, and 64-image storage. A great way to break into the world of digital photography. Dimash Brick from Minolta. It's great fun. Or a set of Revere Pro-Line cookware from Corning. Designed for durability and a lifetime of use. Retains moisture, flavor, and nutrients while cooking. Corningware, a balance of practicality and performance. Enter your ballot at your local Safeway Food and Drug today. CFL Live on TSN is brought to you by Gatorade. Is it in you? And by the new Speed Stick Ultimate Antiperspirant for tough 24-hour protection. All right, a pretty good game to kick off our CFL season on TSN 27-24. The Owls win it. And guys, uh, your impressions? Well, I think the number one thing is there was a point in the first quarter where really Winnipeg could make a separation in terms of the score, but they didn't capitalize on a touchdown as opposed to a field goal. That came back to really, really determine the game in terms of points. I really did like T.J. Rubley. Reminds me of a McManus or a David Archer, a, a same type of three, five, seven step drop back. The big thing on him was could he throw outside of the pocket effectively. I think he, pro he proved the fact that he can, and he's able to throw all the different types of patterns, the far out, the seam, the fade, all the different things. I was pretty impressed with him. He's a good quarterback. Yes, I was. I was too, Chris. But from Montreal's perspective, I, I think the key thing is anytime you can win on the road in this league, 
it's a big win. Uh, a couple of other comments. I was shocked with 30 seconds to go in the game that they ran the option. When you're up by three points, why take a chance of putting the ball on the ground? A field goal sends a game into overtime. And a quick tip of the hat to Terry Baker, James. Uh, you know, four field goals, he was the difference in the game. Turning point of the game? Well, I think the number one thing that is Montreal was able to kind of weather the storm in the first quarter. And then as the game progressed, I thought their offensive line started to become more physical. Early, all we talked about was the Matt Cody and, and the wide receiver possibilities, Jacques Climbing, the, the fact that they had such great outside speed. But the game really got back down to Michael Souls making some big inside traps, Michael Pringle really having a couple of fine runs at critical times. So they really came back to more simplistic offense and were able to execute. You know, but on the other hand, I thought Winnipeg played well. Winnipeg showed me a lot of things like, in my evaluation, they're a little bit better now than when I perceived them earlier in the season. In my mind, the key point was when Montreal didn't lose their composure. You know, early in the game, they had a reason to do that. As, as you said, Chris, they came out in the second half. They simplified their offense, and, and they found a way to win on the road, and that's what it's about in this league. All right, you guys have some fun today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're going to be doing this 33 more times, and our first one is coming up very shortly. Have some dinner, wave some flags, and come back. 10 o'clock tonight, the Hamilton Tigers in Calgary to visit the Stampeders. That'll be our next game for you, 10 o'clock Pacific, sorry, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific is the time on that one. John Wells and Glenn Suter will have the call of that one for you. Coming up next, off the record, curler Mike Harris, Toronto Raptor John Wallace, and rapper Guru. Happy Canada Day, everybody. We'll see you later on tonight. The CFL on TSN, a new season. Hey, we're having fun.